This meeting will now come to order. The clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlett? Here. Vice Mayor Edwards? Here. Councilmember Finn? Here. Councilmember Binsbacher? Here. Councilmember Patena? Here. Councilmember Hunt? Here. And Councilmember Dunn? I guess she's not on yet. All right, thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council meeting of February 16th, 2021. As we continue our work sessions regarding the budget, we will begin our study session agenda this evening with Water Services Department overview and update on enterprise funds and rate study. And I will turn it over to City Manager Jeff Tyne to begin. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you on, on this important item, and that is uh, talking about uh, the state of our water and wastewater operations and its implications uh, on utility rates. And of course, as you're aware, uh, we run our water and wastewater services as a business, as an enterprise. And so as a result of that, any of the trends, issues, conditions that we have within our organization, we want to make sure that you're aware of that and its implications on our rate payers. One of the, the themes that you'll likely see in tonight's study session is that of principles. Uh, we, it has been long-standing principles that have helped us solidify our water portfolio, maintain our operations, and also do so uh, with financial prudence. So you'll be hearing both about our principles of sound water management and principles of sound financial management as they come into play. So with that, I'll first turn it over to Kate Powers, our Water Services Director, and then to Sonia Andrews, our Chief Financial Officer, to discuss the implications. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Sonia and I are very pleased to be here today uh, to discuss one of my favorite topics, which is the Water Services Department, and also discuss our associated utility rates. To accomplish this, we'd like to provide you with an overview of the Water Services Department, which manages the water and wastewater enterprise funds, essentially, discuss a little bit about our management strategy going forward, and specifically touch on some of the current trends we're seeing, for instance, the status of the Colorado River, and how that status might impact the city of Peoria. We also want to point out some of the variables that are impacting both our capital improvement program and our operational budgets as we look forward to developing and approving the budget for fiscal year 2022. And as Jeff mentioned at the end of this, uh, my piece, I'll pass it over to Sonia um, to talk about our utility rates. And we're not gonna just have her talk about just water and sewer rates. She's also gonna cover stormwater and solid waste rates a little bit so that you really can see what rate impacts and, and what changes those might mean to our actual customers and from a customer's viewpoint. So it'll be comprehensive. To start this off, what I'd like to do is quickly remind everyone of the basic size and the components that make up the two enterprise funds within the Water Services Department. The water and sewer systems are extremely valuable city assets that touch virtually every citizen in our city every day and are critical components in maintaining our high quality of life. The department is divided into six basic functional areas. We have sustainability, which of course uh, helps manage and coordinate the city-wide sustainability efforts. We have plant operations responsible for managing our treatment plants, pretty logical. Um, field operations, which operates and maintains our water distribution and sewer collection system. We have the Environmental Resources Group. It may sound a little cryptic, but these are the guys that run around and do lots of water quality testing and stormwater testing as well to ensure we stay in compliance with regulations and provide good drinking water to our citizens. We also have Planning and Engineering, which is the group that manages our capital improvement program, and our Technology Group. <clears throat> Excuse me. Of course, our our uh, capital improvement program receives an awful lot of help from the development and engineering department. They do a lot of the heavy lifting and actually do the construction work, construction management for a lot of uh, water services projects. And lastly, there's the administration to help coordinate and manage the water service efforts. That's where I sit. As you can see on the left side of the slide, the water system has around 51,000 residential water meter services a little over 3,000 non-residential water services, which are a combination of commercial and industrial and other businesses, and just under 1,200 miles of water mains in the system. The diagram shows the rated capacity of the treatment plants that we use to ensure high quality potable water is available to our residents. On the wastewater side, 
On the right-hand side of the slide, the system has just over 53,000 residential sewer accounts and around 1,400 non-residential accounts. We have approximately 800 miles of sewer mains in the ground to serve the citizens of Peoria. You can also see in the diagram on the slide the rated capacity to the three wastewater treatment plants in our system. I think that everyone is pretty much aware that Peoria is growing at a very good rate. And I'd like to remind everyone that we currently have three of our major facilities, that'd be Pyramid Peak, Joe Max, and Beardsley, all in some phase of capacity expansion to accommodate future growth and to just ramp up the resiliency of our system. And this is an important point as we start talking about our capital improvement program. Uh, Pyramid Peak is under construction currently. And you can see on the slide there's an 11 MGD and then a 24 MGD in parentheses. And so the construction project, which will be completed at the end of this year, will take our capacity from 11 million gallons a day up to 24. So we'll get an additional 13 million gallons a day. The Joe Max and Beardsley, both wastewater treatment plants, are uh, currently under design to increase the capacity of those. Now this is a slide you've probably all seen a version of in the past. It's one of my uh, more common ones, I guess, a go-to. And this is just a quick reminder that we maintain a designation of assured water supply from the Arizona Department of Water Resources, as shown on the left-hand side of the slide. And it's a reminder that we receive water not from one source, but from many. We receive water from the Colorado River by, via the Central Arizona Project. We also get water from the Salt River Project, from the Salt and Verde Rivers, and we also use reclaimed water from our wastewater treatment plants. The pie chart on the right has been updated to reflect water usage in 2020, and you can see that we supplied over 36,000 acre feet of water in, in that year. Uh, for, for comparison, it's interesting to note that we had a total water supply of around 32,000 acre feet in 2019, so an increase of 4,000 acre feet of water. And we think this is largely due to the hot, dry, long summer we had. So people were just using more water on their landscaping to fill up their swimming pools and things like that. Are there any questions at this point? Um, I have a question, Kate. <clears throat> The reclaimed water at 11 percent, do we have any specific goals in mind for increasing that percentage? I don't think we have specific goals laid out as far as a quantity goes. The real emphasis as far as reclaimed water goes is to get the highest and best use out of it and use it where we can with the projects we're developing. So for instance, the project, and I'll touch on it a little bit later on in the presentation, you know, we've put a lot of effort into expanding that system and a lot of it is uh, to get the highest and best use, but it's also to position us very well for any future water shortage we might see. It is the one source of water that we really own. It's truly under our control to do with it as we want to. So the idea now is to take it to places like Paloma Park and Alta Vista Park and places like that to start that system up to get a higher and better use. And when we use water that way, it offsets the water or replaces the water we would otherwise use out of either pumping or getting from the CAP or SRP, something like that. So just, just for anyone who might be watching who is unfamiliar with Arizona water, can you just define reclaimed water for us? Yeah, reclaimed water is water that comes to our wastewater treatment plants and we treat it to a very high level and then it's essentially another term for it is recycled water, if you will. So we're able to treat it to a very high level to the point where we put it, we can put it in a lake down at Pioneer Park and put fish in a lake and people can fish the fish out and eat it. So it's, I mean, it's really good water. And uh, that's what reclaimed water. It's essentially water we've recycled and we're getting another use out of. So we can use the same drop of water more than once. Oh yeah. For the same, That's the intent. almost the same cost. Yep. <laughs> All right, thank you. We often talk about water and wastewater funds as if they're a single fund, because we just refer to the water services department. But for the next two slides, I've them broken down so you can understand the basic components and the sizes of the two funds. As you can see on this slide, the current fiscal year 2021 water enterprise funds, so this is the budget that's currently approved, is at 125, uh, what, is at $29 million for operations. The capital budget for just fiscal year 2021 is at about $125 million of, 
and, and it's actually kind of an abnormally high uh, year for the capital improvement budget. An awful lot of that money is related to um, the Pyramid Peak water treatment plant and completing that project. You can see the pie chart on the right, uh, which only includes the operational budget and not the CIP. Roughly a third of the operational budget is just for water supply resources. So it's just under $10 million a year we spend just for water resources to get them to our door to use. The next largest category is field operations group, which makes up about 29% of the total budget. The upcoming proposed um, fiscal year 2022 budgets, the operational budgets, that will get presented to you in a couple months, um, will be largely the same as what you see here, except for a couple of significant impacts that we'll discuss in a couple of moments. Cape, would you mind going back to that one for mm -hmm. a second? If I can hit the button right, I will. That one. There we go. Um, so <clears throat> environmental and water supply and resources, what, what's the difference in those two things? Where are the chemicals that we use to treat the, the water? The chemicals that we use to treat the water will be in the treatment plant operations chunk. So water supply and resources is paying the Central Arizona Projects folks their fees to get the water to us. Yeah. It does also include fees we pay to the city of Glendale, because remember the Pyramid Peak Water Treatment Plant is technically owned by the city of Glendale. We own capacity in that facility. So it's, it is paying for uh, some of the operations and maintenance costs in that facility. When you get to environmental, environmental is the guys running around doing all the testing. It's our labs and the lab work and all of that work. Okay. And all of these funds are paid for when somebody pays their water bill, and wastewater bill every month. That's exactly right. All of this has to be covered by it. This isn't a for-profit company or something like that. We simply set the rates at a point at which we can do cost recovery. So what it costs us to provide these services, we want to recover that money back. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Nope. Moving on to the wastewater enterprise fund, as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, the fiscal year 2021 operations budget is about $12 million, and the capital budget is just under $26 million. The pie chart on the right side of the slide breaks down the various operational budget components, again, not including capital, and by far the largest single expenditure is related to the Butler Water Reclamation Facility, which kind of makes sense because about 60% of our treatment capacity uh, is in the Butler facility. The rest of the operations dollars are spread out over two water reclamation facilities, Beardsley and Jomax, and the collections and environmental divisions. As is the case for the water fund, the proposed budget we've put together for fiscal year 2022 is roughly the same as you see here, again, with a few noted changes we'll go over. And as you can see, the combined water and sewer enterprise funds are pretty significant in size and constitute a good chunk of the overall city budget. These budgets support a team of skilled professional employees who operate and maintain infrastructure that is critical to maintaining our high quality of life in Peoria. Any further questions I can answer? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, if you recall, a number of years ago, the city of Detroit had a lot of water quality issues, and it's been in the news lately mm -hmm. uh, because some people are actually being indicted for that. Um, but so what, what kind of things, kind of safeguards does the city of Peoria have in place so that nothing like that could happen here? Well, that's a, it's a simple question with a really complicated uh, answer. But what, what was happening in, well, Flint, Michigan, other, we've had it in Tucson, other places around that have, that have had water quality problems. Um, they were changing sources. They were going through some pretty significant operational changes that caused problems. And ultimately, I just don't think they were well coordinated. I can tell you that we do a tremendous amount of testing um, to keep ourselves in line. People don't realize it, but we say we have this environmental group, say, that goes out and tests water quality. They do nearly 10,000 tests a year uh, to make sure that we're in compliance. We also have, you know, monitors that test for... Uh, things every four hours like disinfection byproducts and things like that in our plants. So we're, we're crimped down pretty tight on all this stuff. We monitor it very carefully and if we ever have um, a doubt, we act pretty strongly in a direction that corrects that doubt. Um, I'm very confident in our ability to avoid a situation like that. Um, 
and I'll, I'll touch on it in a little bit. There's a, there's a capital improvement project that I'm particularly proud of that we'll talk about here in a minute, but, and it constitutes a change in water supply to uh, the Vistancia area. And, you know, that's when you can have problems if you do changes like that. And we've gone through great extents to avoid those problems. Um, we've done special studies. We're just very confident in how we're going about it. And I think it's, it, a lot of it's just the planning and sweating the little details that go into it. Um, you, you, you don't do these things uh, see to your pants. It's just not, not that way. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's a really good way to put that. You just don't do it by the seat of your pants. And it's not the Peoria way. And I know that we have always had really, really good water quality. And I don't want anyone to be confused with those national news headlines to think that there is any kind of issue here locally in Peoria. There just isn't. No, there's just not. Thank you. The overall water services strategy is guided by the principles of sound water management that Jeff mentioned a couple of moments ago. And this slide includes just some of the principles and ideas, not necessarily a listing of the principles in the document. It's a fascinating read. Should you want a copy, let me know. Uh, and I won't go through all of the, all of that is shown here, but I think it's important to note that we use the concept in the document to guide and reinforce actions that the department takes. Having a sustainable supply is emphasized, for instance, which helps reinforce our push to enhance our use of reclaimed water. Planning for the future is also required and perhaps thought of as a given, right? You're, you should be planning, but we really do put a lot of effort into this area. We really do have our eyes out. What are things gonna look like, not just five years, but perhaps 20 or 30 years from now? We really feel like in our desert environment, we really have to think about things that far out. This is especially true because the projects that we undertake take so long to plan, finance, design, and then construct. And these are facilities that our community relies on and will continue to rely on years and years to provide you know, the quality of life we like. Let's talk a little bit about management strategy and some of the projects and actions we take as a result of that strategy. To put the various, uh, well, water service has been very active over the past year, and listed on the side are some of our more significant achievements for 2020. And I always first like to remind everybody that at our very core, water service's mission is to supply drinking water and treat wastewater for our citizens in a reliable, safe, and efficient manner. In 2020, we successfully delivered over 10 billion gallons of potable water and treated over 4 billion gallons of wastewater. Another significant achievement in the past year has been the completion of the water system link, and I mentioned this earlier, between the main water system in Peoria and the Vistancia area. Vistancia has been provided water service through the use of 10 groundwater wells since its inception. It's always planned to be that way. But through long-term planning that goes back more than 15 years, uh, the planning and construction of a series of capital improvement projects as approved by council has been constructed and next month we'll actually have the ability to move water from one side of the Agua Fria to the other. This is a really big deal for us. We won't have a ribbon cutting or something like that, <laughs> but it's one of those projects that for us, it's a major milestone. Uh, and pro we probably have nearly $100 million um, in projects if you include Pyramid Peak in getting this done. And the project's absolutely vital for the continued development of the area west of the Agua Fria as the 10 wells don't have the capacity to provide the amount of water we need there long term. It also supplies a sustainable source of water for that, that development, something we're really excited about. Uh, in 2020, we also revised our long-term strategy for obtaining the highest and best use of our reclaimed water, as you guys are all well aware of, and, and started taking actions to implement that. We reestablished the sustainability green team we completed a deal with the Central Arizona Water Conservation District, I'm sorry for the acronym, but that's what CAWCD is, uh, to transfer 1,885 acre feet of cap water allocation to Peoria. And this transfer is related to the purchase of the New River Utility Company uh, that the city completed several years ago. We're, we're finally getting that water into our kitty and when we redo our designation of assured water supply, it'll get added to that list. One of the strategy topics uh, that we find ourselves considering quite a bit lately is the continuing de deterioration of conditions on the Colorado River. And as you might recall, as the water surface level on Lake Mead drops, 
certain shortage tiers are triggered. These shortage tiers uh, trigger cutbacks in the amount of water that the Central Arizona Water Project folks can pump out of the Colorado River and deliver to Central Arizona. The United States Bureau of Reclamation, who's responsible for monitoring conditions on the Colorado River, is currently predicting that the water surface will drop to a point where a tier one shortage is declared in 2022, so January of 2022. This is not a done deal yet, but current snowpack on the Colorado River tributary area and other conditions are certainly making it probable. You will certainly hear more about this over the next year in the media, and I expect that uh, you'll be receiving questions regarding this from your constituents as well. The real question at this point is, what does this mean for Peoria? Well, I forgot to go, oh, geez. I'm sorry, I'm messing up the slide. We'll get there. Sorry about that. So the first thing to point out is that a tier one shortage will not impact Peoria's water supplies, okay? Uh, our water rights have a seniority to the point where we will not see actual water cutbacks until the river drops to the point where there is a tier three shortage, okay? If this actually does ever occur, the, the purpose of the tiers is to ratchet back usage as levels drop to avoid getting to a tier three, okay? So the tiers aren't necessarily a bad thing. It's a, it's a, it's a way for us to force conservation, to be blunt. One component of our strategy going forward is to continue to order our full Central Arizona project water allocation so that we can continue to build our bank of long-term storage credits up, okay? Another component is to continue to make system improvements to maximize the use of our other water resources, such as reclaimed water, and prepare for the possibility of future water supply impacts. And this is part of why we're advocating for changes in how we manage our reclaimed water assets. This is part of that planning. In addition, we're planning for future financial impacts related to this so that we can maintain the financial health of our water enterprise funds. There's one thing we know, and we discussed it here before, is that we're not exactly sure what the conditions in the future uh, of the Colorado River are, but we know that it's very likely water is just going to continue to become more and more expensive over time. The idea of ordering our full allocation now and accumulating long-term storage credits is if that's the case and water becomes more expensive, now's the time to accumulate those credits, right? Any questions on that? No questions. Our management strategy going forward in the next year includes, of course, continuing to deliver high quality water and sewer services to our customers. We also want to provide a more robust water system and accommodate planned growth. So we'll, we will complete the improvements to the Pyramid Peak water treatment plant, complete the design of the capacity upgrades at Beardsley and Jomax, as we discussed, to help us plan for possible future, future water shortages and become better stewards of the resources available to us. We will update the sustainability action plan, begin some construction on the next phase of the expansion of the reclaimed water system, and make water quality improvements at the Greenway Water Treatment Plant. Mm -hmm. And we will, of course, stay engaged in water resource issues on a state and local level. So let's talk for a few minutes about variables impacting water and wastewater budgets. And I've mentioned several times during this uh, presentation that we're experiencing these impacts. We don't have a whole lot of control over some of them, uh, but they will affect the water and wastewater enterprise funds. Mm -hmm. Over the course of the next couple of slides, I'll point some of the significant factors out that are impacting these funds as we look forward to the budgets for 2022. These are the big items that impact rates that we all pay, including myself, for water and sewer service. The first of these impacts is the Water Enterprise Fund is due to the completion of the capacity expansion at the Pyramid Peak Water Treatment Plant. Although we will certainly appreciate having 13 million gallons additional a day uh, available to us and all of our customers, we will have to pay additional operational costs for this. And we expect to see costs rise approximately $270,000 for fiscal year 2022 and you'll see an additional $270,000 come up in the following year, in fiscal year 2023. 
the total amount is split out over a couple of years due to the timing of the project completion and when we have to start paying these new amounts. Is there any questions on this item? Perhaps. <laughs> <clears throat> The next category of impact is the capital improvement program and includes both water and wastewater enterprise funds. In our efforts to keep our systems updated and resilient, plan to accommodate future growth and obtain higher value out of our water assets, we continue to have a significant number of capital improvements planned for the next 10 years. These are investments in our community. As mentioned earlier, of our five major plants, we have three of them undergoing some stage of expansion. We are also expanding our reclaimed water system. As you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, that's project one that's currently under design and will start construction later on this year. You know, all of this is planned and necessary work as we continue to grow and again, provide for our citizens now and into the future. Mayor and Council, any questions on this item? Questions? The last significant impact to the enterprise funds I'd like to touch on is water supply, which includes the cost to purchase water from the Salt River project that is treated at our Greenway water treatment plant and from the Central Arizona project folks that primarily supplies Pyramid Peak water for treatment. SRP costs increases for the coming fiscal year are mostly explained by their continuing effort to decouple their water and power business. Essentially for years, power has been subsidizing and keeping water rates lower. And so they're decoupling those and budget impacts to us is expected to be about $80,000 next year. And we sort of expect to see an, uh, an increase for years to come. There are several factors that affect increases in the Central Arizona Water Conservation District folks. The first one is the anticipated transfer of the 1885 acre feet of cap water allocation I mentioned. This is related to our purchase of the New River Utility Company. Essentially, our water allocation is going up by 1885 and we have to assume responsibility for paying the capital costs and the delivery fees of this water. It really points out how expensive it is to hold this water, sort of bank it for future use. Just, you have to pay the fees until you actually get the usage out of it and beyond. The second cost increase noted is the result of planning for a tier one shortage on the Colorado River as previously mentioned. We don't know for sure and won't know until August if a tier one shortage is officially declared, but we have to plan for it in our budgets now. And the combined budget impacts due to the Central Arizona Water Conservation Allocation Transfer and the tier one shortage is approximately $1.4 million. This is the last of the significant budget impacts, although we will also experience a usual smaller impact such as inflation, legislation, and technology changes. All of this prompts a pretty serious effort on our part in water services to get better at what we do, to operate our facilities more efficiently, to get better, higher, and better use out of the water resources we have, to try and do what we can to offset some of these cost increases. We spend an awful lot of time talking about those issues. Next. Uh, I'd like to pass it over to Sonia Andrews for discussion of utility rates going forward. But before I do, are there any last questions for me? Of course, as long as I'm up here, you can play stump the director. Councilmember Patena. Thank you, Mayor. Cape, just a uh, more of a curiosity question. When you mentioned you're going to be doing upgrades on our water treatment plants, what do some of those upgrades consist of? I'll give you an example. We have the Greenway water treatment plant, for instance. Um, right now, every year in the summer, uh, we track and monitor water quality that comes out of that facility and we meet all the rules and regulations that um, are required, okay? Uh, but we'd like to l meet them even to a higher degree. It's kind of hard to explain, but it will let us push the water farther out into our system. Right now, we aren't able to use our full Salt River project allocation that goes to Greenway. And by making water quality improvements there, we believe we can push it out farther, we can use more of it, and we can turn some of the wells that we currently pump water out of the ground to supply customers, we can turn some of those down. It won't be that we don't use them, but we'd like to turn them down because the well water and pumping is more expensive than using the Salt River project water. So if we can get the water quality even to a higher level, extend it out, we think we can save some money doing that. 
It's very similar to Vistancia. By putting surface water over into Vistancia, we think we can take those 10 wells over there and we can ratchet them down. We won't turn them off because we always want them available for use, right? But if we can turn them down a little bit, we'll save quite a bit of money over there. Um, it, so those are the kind of efficiencies we're looking at. It's, it's really about fine-tuning your system and seeking out little opportunities. Um, Cape, I just want to make a comment, um, and that is about planning for the future. All of the things that we are doing to plan for the future um, are expensive, no doubt. It's expensive to bank water, you know, to, to um, keep our, our facilities at the highest quality, you know, at the highest upgrades that we can. Uh, but it's just like buying insurance, you know. If, if you don't have it, you are going to be really sorry. And water is the most important thing that anyone can ever have, and we must plan. It's not, we can't be surprised that we have more growth coming to our city. You know, we have to plan for all of that growth as it happens. And as water becomes much more expensive every day, it seems, uh, we have to be able to make sure that that is something that we can handle in our budget, and that includes all those efficiencies that you were talking about, as well as banking water for the future. So I just thoroughly appreciate everything that you're doing to make sure that we not only have what we need now, but we have what we need 20 years from now. And then in 20 years, we're going to need to you know, have that same amount in 40 years from now. So it's really, really important that we do everything that we can to plan for the future. So I just appreciate everything that you guys do. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for those comments. I appreciate it. Anything else? Okay, I think you can move on. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So every five years or so, the city conducts a comprehensive rate study to look at um, our rates, make sure that they're still meeting our objectives, and also project out the rate requirements to meet the system needs that Cape just talked about. So it's been about five years since we've conducted one of these rate studies. So last year, we contracted with a rate consultant, FCS Group, out of Seattle, to update our five-year rate studies. Um, our consultants are unfortunately not able to join us tonight because of COVID travel restrictions. Um, so our rate studies looked at all three utilities, the water, wastewater utilities, plus our solid waste utility as well. And the rate studies have been completed. We have copies of them for you if you would like, you know, for anybody if they'd like to read it. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what is involved in this comprehensive rate study. There's a lot of things we look at when we go through a rate study. Uh, we review our financial policies and priorities for the utility systems. We do a detailed cost of service analysis, making sure we understand the true cost of providing services, all the costs that Cape just mentioned, um, whether we are achieving a cost recovery as we want to. Um, we do a revenue requirement forecast, basically projecting the revenues needed to cover all those costs. We also make sure we're allocating our costs to the right customer groups, so our residential and commercial customers are being uh, charged equitably. And finally, we look at our rate design or our rate structure to make sure that our rate structure is equitable, promotes conservation, and is affordable. So kind of to summarize, our comprehensive rate study is done to ensure that we continue to meet and maintain our four primary rate objectives, cost recovery, rates, uh, revenue stability, equity and conservation, and affordability. The results of our rate study show that in order for us to continue meeting and maintaining these objectives and also funding all the costs that Cape talked about, we need to continue our rate adjustments for the next five years. So, um, and I won't go over the next few slides. These are pri primarily the reasons for the rate adjustments as Cape has already gone through in detail, operating cost increases, plant upgrades and expansion, sustainability conservation efforts, and then aging infrastructure as well. On the solid waste side, um, Kevin, our public works director, will have a study session on his solid waste operations, I think, um, next. And so he'll go over this in detail as well. But the uh, cost drivers for the solid waste rates are landfill costs, recycling costs, as most of you have heard about the China sword, the switch in the uh, market shift in the revenue and expense over there, and also fleet costs. Um, so. 
with the, um, all these cost drivers, you know, one would expect that our rates are going to be really, really high, and um, especially all the scary things that Cape had just mentioned. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> You'd think that our rates need to be uh, significantly uh, higher. But we're very pleased to um, let council know that our rates remain one of the most affordable in the Phoenix metro area. And one of the reasons is because of, thank you to council, council's discipline in raising rates incrementally, you know, small incremental increases every year to keep up with the rate requirements. That's really key in us maintaining our rates affordable. Um, so this chart compares the total average residential bill for an average customer, residential customer. Most of our customers have a three-quarter inch meter. Our average customer uses about 10,000 gallons of water a month. And on the sewer side, it's about 8,000 gallons that's used to calculate the sewer charge. So what this shows is the average residential utility bill. As you can see, Peoria, before taxes and fees, an average resident pays about $86.08. And based on our study, our five-year study, we are projecting that we will need to continue sort of a 2 to 3% annual increase over the next five years. And what this slide shows you is the combined bill impact proposed for the next two years. So at the bottom here, you can see currently our average customer is paying $86.08, and we're expecting that to go up to $88.44, and then another 2.77% increase to $90.89. And as you can see, for stormwater, I just wanted to mention that we're not proposing any increase at all to the stormwater over the next five years, or two, three years. And um, again, small incremental increases for water, wastewater, and sewer. And that is really amazing, uh, you know, considering all the costs and all the expense that uh, Cape just went through with you. I think that um, this is a very affordable solution for our customers. Can I, and um, Sonia, if I can interrupt? Oh, time for questions. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think it is that all of those other cities have such a higher charge than, than the city of Peoria. When you show that graph, you know, we're third from the bottom there. Um, and I know that there's some exceptional differences in some of the, you know, Goodyear and Buckeye. But overall, what are we doing so well? I can um, also help. And then um, what Cape's going to do is then he's going to correct me nicely after I go through this. <laughs> so. I think there's a couple of observations to this, and one of those is the principles that we've had in place for a long time to take care and have those insurance policies in place. And as a result of that, you have a very robust, new, well taken care of system and infrastructure. You have water supplies that have been secured years ago, and as a result, you can see, for example, we're not affected in the first tier, for example. As a result, CAP water supply is more affordable to us. Uh, a couple of the other factors include that, just that the, the cost of CAP water is different in some areas, it was not as accessible. Some of the newer communities are uh, having to locate at a higher cost the, the CAP allocations. Some of the cities below us are more on the SRP system, as a matter of fact. Uh, so those are some of the, the factors that come into play, but uh, Cape, anything else that comes to mind? Yeah, it's, I mean, there's a, every city's different and how their rates are made up are different. Um, we won't even talk about Goodyear and Buckeye because they're kind of special cases. Uh, but the others, um, we don't, we're a fairly new city, so we don't have a whole lot of old, old infrastructure that we're spending millions of dollars rehabbing. We have some needs out there, but we're taking them on slowly and surely over time. I think that helps an awful lot. I think the mix of our water resources helps a lot. Some of these cities use a lot more groundwater and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having access to all the different water sources helps it, it's a uh, all of them have their own little story and it's sort of until you dig down into each one it's a little hard to determine but some of them are just denser than others and less dense so if you have more miles of pipe to service a given group of customers it can be more expensive to maintain that those miles of pipe that's kind of the good year in the buckeye problem really thank you Kim. well and and i think you said at the beginning that we have 
1,200 miles of water mains and 800 miles of sewer mains. So we do have a lot of geography to cover. And so I just, again, want to thank you for making sure that we are as efficient as we can possibly be and planning for the future so that we can get the best rates and have the, the um, uh, diverse diversity in water sources that we have. I just, uh, you know, it's it's not easy. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it, right? <laughs> so again, I thank you for that. That's the end of our presentation, so we can take any other questions. Anyone have anything else? I think it's all been said. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak. Appreciate it. All right. Mr. Tyne, um, next study session is update on community engagement. Great. Thank you. As we do the transition, I just wanted to mention the next topic termed uh, vaguely community engagement is actually one I'm, I'm very excited to present on. There are so many ways that we interact with our public and we engage our public, whether that, of course, is uh, through outreach and notification of different city-related initiatives or feedback that we receive from our residents and from our businesses back, obviously, which you're uh, many a recipient of. Uh, with that in mind, the landscape continues to evolve. There's so many things that change in the way that we interact and relate with our public. Uh, think of the changes in mass media over the last decade, the advent of social media, new technology of which we'll talk a little bit about tonight. And of course, Peoria continues to mature and evolve as well. And as a result, different communities have different needs. So with that in mind, we have a thoughtful group that has put together a, a very thoughtful community engagement strategy, which we'll hear tonight. So with that, I'll introduce first our Deputy City Manager, Eric Strunk, who will then introduce Mr. Hallett. Thank you, Mr. Tyne, uh, Mayor and Council. Shifting gears from water and water, um, wastewater resources, uh, Jeff is absolutely right. Um, this is something that uh, kind of came from within the organization, and we're very excited to be here before you this evening to kind of talk a little bit about community engagement, um, kind of a recent survey of departments that we did, and also some outside entities, uh, some of our major utility providers. Um, and what we've learned from that. And we've also got a few recommendations we're gonna share with you. But before I kind of start that off and go into that, I wanna to thank the city manager for kind of turning us loose on this a little bit. Um, community engagement, community communication is one of those areas that everyone thinks they may know the answer when in reality there's always room for improvement. I think what you'll find overall tonight is the good news is Peoria does a pretty darn good job of, of engaging its citizens in a variety of different formats. But there's also some things we can put into play to help us achieve um, a more robust engagement strategy. And you're going to see a model here in a few minutes that we hope to uh, share with you and convince you that it's gonna be worth our time as an organization. Real quickly, uh, the team that we had assembled, in addition to myself, um, Mr. Tyne was on it, Chris Hallett, our Director of Neighborhood and Human Services. Um, behind me, you may see Daniel Murillo, he's our Council Assistant. You may see Sharon Roberson, she's uh, Assistant to the City Manager. We also probably have a couple of folks on there that are watching in. Um, we had Jennifer Sign, our Communications Director, and we had Jay Davies, uh, our chief of staff, to the city manager's office. So a very good, robust group. Um, as, as I mentioned, as part of our assessment, we interviewed 10 different city departments, and we started with that. Doesn't mean we're done. This will be an evolution. Um, we also uh, talked to six different utility companies, and we asked them several questions, and you'll see, I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit. Um, these are a few of the questions that we, we asked them. Um, we asked them, how do they view the importance of engagement? Um, do they see that as being different from communication? Um, what are some of the techniques they utilize to encourage participation in our community with the program services or even infrastructure projects with which they're involved? What are some of the challenges that um, they are faced with? Each department has different focus, different mission, different considerations, different layering they have to work through. So it's very much a, a dynamic situation when you talk about community engagement. There's no one right answer to what engagement is other than we want to do the best job we can to basically collectively interact with those we provide programs and services to 
And that's a two-way street. It's not only us, but it's also our community at large. A uh, quick flashback, you may recall this from a presentation that Mr. Hallett and his team did last month when they were talking about neighborhood and human services. Um, this model uh, basically shows uh, uh, engagement on a very localized community neighborhood level. It talks about our AMPM program, our neighborhood services, our community block grant program. And in this particular case, this department does this to engage our communities and help them uh, feel connected, a sense of pride about where they are. It's very individualized um, focus, but at the same time, it can be a very broad-based focus if you're looking at communities and neighborhoods. These all triggered a deeper thought. Um, what are the rest of our departments doing in this area? Um, this really is an organizational value, just not a department. And if you take a peek at this slide here, uh, we asked ourselves, what, what can we kind of do better? Um, Engagement can run the gamut. It can be simple information, um, inform. It could be actual empowerment. I mean, you tell us what you'd like to see, and we're going to turn the keys over to you. There's a spectrum of engagement, and it's our responsibility to, to figure out and work with the right level of engagement as we encounter different situations. To the right of the slide there, um, you'll see a series of, of recent initiatives that you're all familiar with that have popped up over the past year or so in the city of Peoria. Um, we always have CIP designs, new streets, park enhancements, new parks in some cases. We have a neighborhood recycling program. We had the recent general plan discussion and approval by our voters by a pretty significant margin. Um, very, very engaged uh, process there. And we also have, as Kate mentioned, in, in water planning, a lot of future planning projects that are underway that we need to occasionally dial in and connect with our residents on to get their perspective. If you go to the next slide, um, when we engaged our, our departments, um, a few key things we learned, and this is, it's always fascinating to hear this within our organization. Um, to, to a department, to a person, um, all had a very high value of engagement. When we said, score it on a scale from zero to 10, it was pretty much a 10. Um, when we asked them, where do you think you lay on that spectrum with regards to actual practicing, uh, operationalizing it, uh, it was kind of six to 10. So that tells us that there's definitely room for improvement and we can accomplish that uh, through coordination that you'll hear about, a little bit about in a few minutes. Um, engagement is defined differently by each department. Um, the scope is different and the techniques are different. And one of the most fascinating questions we ask is what do you currently do to encourage communication and engagement and we heard everything from we will do informational campaigns we will do text messaging we will go out on a neighborhood basis and engage large groups small groups we do site-based visitations I mean it just ran the gamut and it's very healthy and very robust which was very reassuring a couple of neat things we heard, you'll see those in red. Uh, we got a lot of comments from those we, we spoke with. I think the three that, that I've highlighted mean the most to me, um, given, given what this is all about, um, how, do you, how would you define community engagement? And, and a few of our, our departments said they are interactions to provide a sense of ownership in the community. Um, it's great to hear that it's ownership not only from the department, but it's also from the neighborhood in the service or program. Identifying resident needs at a personal level and how to connect with them. I think that's absolutely critical. It shows that we try our best to, to kind of try to get in the mindset of those we serve and ask them what's important to you. That connection is critical. And I think we saw a lot of that um, over the past year during COVID. And it taught us that, hey, sometimes we need to throw the playbook away and really reach out and connect in different ways. And we're very happy about that. Public engagement is critical to trust and transparency. To me, that's probably the biggest, most important piece of what we do, trust, and you'll hear that over and over again, and you'll see that in the model that we're pro proposing that we, we engage. That trust factor is essential. Um, we have an opportunity to be credible with our residents, with our neighborhoods. In turn, if we can demonstrate that and do it very thoughtfully, they will reciprocate and engage us in a very thoughtful and proper manner. 
Transparency, of course, is, is very important. We're a public organization, and we want to share that with those we serve. Real quickly, um, you'll see here, these are a few of the uh, outside utility companies we engaged. Again, the good news, um, I think they all express a willingness to continue working with us in our engagement techniques. As you know, these companies uh, are held to kind of a different standard, and they define those standards themselves. So part of the conversation we've had is we have expectations in the city of Peoria when we look at tearing up a street or putting in a utility, and we want very much you to be aware of those and the impact you have on the community. Fortunately, the bulk of those we spoke with said, yep, we get it, we understand that, we want to have the conversation. And that last bullet point um, on there is very important. Um, they, they want to continue the conversation. We do meet on a regular basis with our engineering department and a few of our other um, more professional, if you will, uh, focused um, departments, but this is about taking it to the next level and going, hey, what can we do to partner with you to get word out? Um, and they express that as well. They have their techniques they use, um, same thing we do. Doubling down is always a good thing. So we heard a lot of good things from, from our partners and we propose to engage them as well. Um, this here is the, the three-pronged approach that we were discussing. Um, we're kind of looking at relationship building. Um, Chris, Mr. Howitt spoke to you last month about that. He's going to address that here in the next few slides. We also look at proactive outreach. Um, what are we doing to go out and, and capture new groups or reestablish re our intent with existing groups? Uh, we want them to come back to us. We want to be able to go to them when we need to. And that third piece you see up there, sometimes things happen, reactive outreach. And those are kind of the unplanned, uh, episodic uh, events that may occur in our city. It, it could be, um, you know, God forbid, a horrible crime, um, a, a infrastructure project that's got an entire area excited, um, and we need to know how to navigate those and work with our partners, our outside partners, to make sure we're satisfying the interests of our residents. So before I go on, um, just the last bullet point on your slide there, the trust factor. If we do this the right way, which we have every intent of doing, um, it's gonna lead to a high level of trust in, in the community with not only city programs, but also what may, neighborhoods may want to accomplish. To kind of talk about some specific actions, Chris is going to go over the next few slides. And I'll note real quickly, I know I'm talking fast. Um, one of our key presenters um, wanted to be here tonight but couldn't be, and that was uh, Ms. Stein. She, she got stuck due to the, the bad weather in the Midwest. Um, and I'm sure she's watching eagerly on, uh, on, on Channel 11 and is rooting us on here. So Chris will cover her items as well. So Chris, if you will. Thank you, Mr. Strunk, Mayor and Council. Happy to be here to follow up the conversation we started last month with our department. Mm -hmm. As I said then, uh, the relationship building, that's kind of the core and essence of what our department is, so it, it makes sense it's gonna reside in our department. Uh, this is the grassroots efforts that we're going out there to build relationships and trust, that trust factor that it, Mr. Strunk was talking about out in the community through organic interactions that we can have with them. Uh, we want to be able to expand all of our uh, databases that we have. Uh, any number of us have our own interrelational databases with the community that we monitor what we do. We want to grow those connections. Uh, we want to continue building um, our rapport with them through events. And we talked about our, our neighborhood toolkit and building and enhancing that. We've added the pop-up trailer and other ways to do it. COVID has presented us a number of ways where we've been able to pivot in response to the needs of those community. Again, every time we identify a need and are able to connect them to services, we build that trust factor, we build that relationship, and that's, a, that's an ongoing relationship. They don't just go away when the, the event goes away or the pandemic goes away or whatever their community issue goes away. We need to be able to monitor and nurture that relationship over time and use that information in order to better serve them over time um, in a safe and healthy way. So we're looking at different ways to do the, uh, build our, and what we learned is we're gonna come out doing things a lot differently than we did going into the pandemic. You know, we had to pivot to, to uh, virtual and drive-throughs and grab-and-goes, and, and there's, there could be a place in a better service delivery model 
outside of this, a hybrid where we're doing multiple interfaces and using technology and different service level approaches based on what we learned. Uh, we want to build internal and external uh, liaison programs. We want to develop a team across departments who are inter already engaging with neighborhoods. Uh, you heard the water service department has their own engagement, sustainability. Every department has a little niche of what they're doing. And what we're hoping to do with this prong is have a consistent, streamlined approach on how we're going to do that across the city as an organization and how the community is going to see us when we get to them. Uh, before I go there, uh, one of the key things uh, is, is that monitoring, how do we track that? And the last bullet point on the right is you've already funded previously a constituent or customer relation management software. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit in depth in that because this is a huge tool in our toolbox that's going to really help us manage our relationships from your level all the way down to the line staff level on how we're inter interacting with the customers and how do we know what everybody else in the city is doing we all have the same last name, City Peoria, but they always think we know what everybody else's business is. This CRM, Customer Relationship Management, is going to help us to be able to do that. So going a little bit deeper on that, this little graphic here really demonstrates, just picture we have about 17 different departments and functions. Every one of us has at least one, if not a half dozen um, databases that we manage our, our processes in. And across the board, they don't generally talk to each other. So at any one time, we don't know what anybody else is doing in the same neighborhood. We have, what, uh, 55 diff 55,000 different accounts that we, uh, the water services just mentioned that they have with sewer and water out there. Well, those are all our residents that we're working with, whether we're in parks, neighborhood services, street management, solid waste, you name it. Uh, so what we need is a system that's going to be, uh, and the successful ingredients are going to include citizen engagement, streamline processing, data analytics and reporting, and workflow enhancements. Uh, again, you, this CRM will be a, a web-based portal on the front end that will connect all of the existing databases so it's, it could be seamless. And it really puts the customer at the forefront instead of our individual program or service. So it gets us out of that silo and gives us a big, broad perspective. Uh, and it's going to work towards building a, a culture change here, one of uh, customer service oriented, you know, with the focal point being on the customers. Um, we're going to have multi-platforms ability to interact with our constituent base. Uh, you can use your cell phone, your tablet, your web base, uh, text, SMS, any number of different integrations to start an order, um, respond to an order, update the customer on the order, um, interrelations between different levels of the, the city, different departments. Uh, different, uh, the elected official, city management, and, and the line worker. Um, we really think that this is it's going to have GIS implications. You can do mapping, you can do sorting, uh, data analytics and reporting, trend analysis, and to really further refine how we're doing our business. And we think building a culture at a point of contact will also give us a forethought of not just the customer across the counter from us, but how is this going to impact our neighborhood, and is there another engagement opportunity based on that transaction? So that's a lot real quick on the relationship building and how a key ingredient that's really going to span all three prongs here of the, of the spectrum. But any, just pause here for any questions so far on the relationship building or our CRM. Councilmember Patena. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, hey, um, <coughs> under relationship building, you have grow community connections, continue neighborhood events, provide a safe uh, community, and expand registered neighborhood database. I can understand how you can do all that with an HOA. How do you do that in a non-HOA community? Uh, Mayor, Councilmember Patena, I mean, that's a great example. So we have a multitude of databases already. We have an HOA database. We already started a neighborhood-based organization database for the non-HOAs. This is where the relationship building is identifying and building the capacity in neighborhoods, storing that information somewhere uh, so when we come back to them, we can further their needs and connect them to future needs. So there's Block Watch database, there's all these databases, there's GIS where we have school-based data, and all these can ultimately be overlaid, and right now they just, they just don't talk to each other, and that's where the CRM is going to help pull all that together. So we have... 55,000 different customer accounts. That's, that's the same data set that we're all kind of sharing in each of our widgeted databases out there. And the CRM will help provide a connectivity 
that we're using like information across all the databases within the city. So it allows us to, if you have an address, you all have addresses in Peoria, you're gonna be one of those 55,000 customers. We're now gonna be able to tack onto that based on known information, your water account, um, you, you had a, a complaint system coming in, this will help uh, complaints coming into each of your offices, which we'll touch on on the reactive. It's really gonna provide the connectivity on all the history and documentation of communications with that resident, uh, their access to their parks in their area, what district they're in, it's just, it opens up the door of information flow two-way, as Mr. Strunk said earlier. It won't be just a one-way. It's going to be an interactive tool where they can converse with us. We, any one of us can pull up and see, well, I know what my department is. Oh, I can see they pulled a permit for construction. I need to connect our team to make sure we're engaged around all the things that are happening at the household level, at a block level, or at the neighborhood level. Sounds like you have it covered. Thank you. Vice Mayor Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chris, on your first slide, um, when you talked about your partnerships with the uh, SRP, APS, and, and the other entities, um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, we've had problems time and time again where uh, an entity will come in and do, repair, you know, an upgrade or repairs, and um, it'll, they'll come in, they'll tear up a street uh, in a neighborhood, and they're disruptive, to say the least. Uh, little to no notification to the residents, and then when they do the work, and um, you know the, our offices are the ones getting the complaints thinking it's a city of Peoria project when it's clearly not. And then when they leave, um, the road or the right-of-ways are not put back in the condition that they once were. Who is responsible for making sure that they're putting the um, roads back into the shape that they found them prior to their doing the excuse me, doing the work? Because the city of Peoria should not burden the cost of repairing a road that a, a utility came in and tore up. Yeah, the mayor, uh, uh, Vice Mayor Edwards, I can try to tackle that one. Um, I'll kind of want to tip the hat a little bit to our engineering department. Um, first of all, I'll back up. Uh, there's state legislation that, that in some cases uh, allows that to occur. Um, that all being said, um, there is an expectation that uh, we kind of put things back the way we we discovered them as we started the project. Our engineering department um, often uh, will issue uh, permits for work in a utility right away, um, or just on a right away in general. Or if there's an open street cut, they certainly need to issue a permit for that. And the, most of the utilities are pretty good about coming in and doing that. Every now and then, you will get a, a, a company, a subcontract, whatever you want to call it, that might forget to replace the granite or might leave a cone out or whatever it is or, or might not necessarily notify the neighborhood. Um, it, and that, in, sorry to interrupt you, but it's sometimes more serious than leaving a cone out on a street. Sometimes it's leaving a pothole in the road for quite some time. You know, I, I'm talking about the Beardsley connector for one, and I know that was multiple jurisdictional with Glendale and us, but you know, when that utility company went in there, they tore that road up, left it down to one lane uh, for weeks and you know, we were getting hundreds of phone calls from residents saying, you know, what is going on here? And then when they finally did put it back together, it was nowhere close to the shape that it was when they started. I think in that case, we have to have the conversation with the utility and work with the permitting system we have in place. When we spoke with them, that particular entity, SRP, or just in general, what we heard from them was, yeah, they do want to be good neighbors. They do want to do the right thing. And, and there was an admission that at times they do have consultants that go in that don't practice the same principles they do. So that all being said, it's our job to work with them to make sure they're educated, they know what our expectations are, and if they don't, we, we raise it to the next level. But I'm just appreciative of you guys. I'm not trying to, you know, harp oh, on absolutely. it, but I just building that relationship is just so important, you know, so that they understand what our expectations are and we know what they're going to be doing. So I just really appreciate you taking the time and explaining it a little bit more because I think from a resident standpoint, they just don't understand. And you know, when they see construction, they assume that it's on a city street, that it's a city of Peoria project, and a lot of times it's not. Mayor, Vice Mayor, that's absolutely correct. Um, they, they see that as a city of Peoria project. And we're the ones, you're the ones who get the call, and our job is to answer that call as best we can. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, that's a perfect segue to our proactive Excuse prong. Me. Chris, just one minute before you move on, Councilmember Hunt. Uh, thank you. 
I wanted to piggyback on Bill's question about how do you organize an event where there's no HOA? How do you reach out to those people? And we certainly had a huge and wonderful example of that this last Saturday in Varney. Now, were you going to touch on this in any other part of your, I don't mean to preempt if you're going to talk about it later. Uh, yes, actually, uh, Mayor, Councilmember Hunt, yes, uh, the Varney cleanup and bulk trash educational project we did this week was a little bit of both proactive and kind of community engagement. We've been wanting to build a relationship and the non-HOA parts of town are going to be the hardest ones. So the ones with the highest need to build the capacity, HOAs have boards and they have property managers, they have common areas and, and funding to deal with all that. A non-HOA is a much more difficult animal to crack. So we have to build the capacity through outreach and engagement, trying to develop leadership. We want to develop a training uh, program for community leadership. Uh, we want to tap into the PLI that's already in there and have a continuity beyond that, uh, or maybe more dedicated uh, kind of streamlined approach to that. So those are, those are the great questions because those are the ones with the highest needs and the, and the least access to those um, uh, resources and that's where our engagement is going to connect them to that and what we hope to build is neighborhood based organizations or neighborhood associations and create a formalized uh, way for them to f form around like neighbors like-minded on what things they want to do for their neighborhood we can build strategic uh, plans for their neighborhood uh, again all this ties back to your livability goals and how livable is their neighborhood what ma could make it more livable and develop that action with them that's where the crm we can start documenting on what this plan is and how we're going to approach it and what resources what departments what agencies we need to engage uh, in order to fulfill those needs so just real, real briefly, how did you do that for Saturday? And, and it was more than a Saturday event. It went on all week. And I drove around in there, and the, the visual on it is astounding. It's totally, totally a cleanup and a beautification project. So not to take the whole time, but can you just say a few of those things that you just said you'd have to do? What did you do in Varney? Yes, uh, Mayor Councilmember Hunt, I can use that as an example to go okay. through our proactive project sure. that works go ahead. for you. That'll kind of help connect some of those dots. Perfect. So on our proactive, so the reactive is organically, whereas the department we're out there, or in the, in the relationship building, we're out there doing it. What we want to use on a proactive, this is more of a um, project or department driven approach to engaging with the neighborhood. So in this case, their bulk trash was coming up last week, right? And historically, we've had some issues with their recycling and contaminants in the recycling. We thought together, working with our sister department, Public Works, there's a great opportunity in your office, quite honestly, you had suggested there's ways we can help clean up that neighborhood. And this is kind of where it all came together, is we thought we'd proactively arrange this coordinated uh, approach. So we had bulk trash for three days leading up. Saturday, we, we went out, uh, and, I, and I do want to mention um, Adam Johnson is also here. He's our, thanks to you and some of the funding we've done, our community engagement uh, coordinator. He worked with Daniel uh, and the Public Works team of engagement specialists there to have a Saturday presence. So they got, Public Works brought out uh, a tire truck, which I heard just filled up instantaneously. <laughs> so that tells you there's a lot of tire needs in, in that neighborhood. And we already had some intel on that from what they see uh, inert material. So, uh, they knew it would be a lot to take up during bulk trash, so we said, let's come on the heels of that. Let's do a heavy campaign. Adam and Daniel flyered their neighborhood. They did some knock and talks. They did, educated them. Hey, you have an upcoming bulk trash. We want to connect you to all the services. Um, we have small tools. We have any number of things that we gave them information-wise. And by the way, we'll be Saturday at Varney Park. We're going to have a place where you can, if you get stuff either to your curb, public work staff with their little Kubotas are going to come by and pick it up and haul it away, any inert materials. Uh, we have a tire bin. And, and then we gave them a goodie bag for those who came through and did a drive-through right there at the, at the um, Varney Park. So it was safely distant. Everybody was masked. And... and heavy on the education and outreach up front. And what I heard, and unfortunately I wasn't able to be there, I got called out of town, but uh, tremendous results from um, heavily use of our services. I haven't heard yet how well the bulk trash went compared to what showed up on Saturday. Uh, but you know, we're all victim to, I, I missed that opportunity. You know, bulk trash was in the middle of the week and I, I work and I wasn't able to get the stuff out there. So does that help answer the question you were asking? <laughs> 
appreciated it. Two of my dilemmas always have been, what do you do with tires? And what do you do with concrete? Do you, they get fined if it's visible, and yet do you just eat it? Because there's no way that we recycle that. So you did a special outreach for those, and the tire truck was full, not so much the concrete. Uh, I also wanted to mention that you uh, held hands with the friends of the Peoria Public Library. They put a book in e a new book in each one of the goodie bags, and um, Sefton was there on Saturday. I, I don't know for sure which part he played, if he put seeds in the packets or what, but thanks to his group, and really just thanks to all of you. It's tremendous, tremendous outreach, and a really ex good example of what can be done in problem neighbor neighborhoods, which Danette and I have mostly non-HOA neighborhoods. So thank you, thank you tremendously. Yes, we really believe proactive is gonna have a, lot, a big impact on our ability to um, have successful outcomes. And what we're creating, even though we have a three-pronged engagement approach within this system, we have a three-pronged approach. It's the city manager support and advisory on how we want to engage these. And a lot of these are going to be case by case, project by project, um, cases or department uh, initiatives. Uh, so we need the departments, and we're going to have a robust training program across all these departments. On They're going to be the subject matter expert. They already know they have to do uh, resurfacing, or they have to do bulk trash, or they've got, they're the subject matter expert. What we want to do is pair them up with the Office of Communications so we can take their content and, you know, have the, the city Office of Communication check it for public information and make sure it's, it's done in a professional manner. And then we're also going to run it by our department who kind of speaks the neighborhood language to make sure we're not talking above their head. So when it's a, a project that's either one of our partners out there or another agency, that's where we're working with our departments to have kind of this engagement um, interaction. I talked earlier about if I'm at the counter taking a permit for a utility to go tear up the road to do something, their customer across the the counter right then is the utility company, but all the customers behind them are all the residents that are gonna be impacted by that permit. Mm -hmm. and, we, and we need to connect those. We can't just, here's your permit, you know, and that's that silo tunnel vision. We wanna use this to build that culture of, ooh, I have a neighborhood impact. Uh, we, we're gonna develop these uh, Peoria pro teams. These are gonna be proactive professionals from the departments of OC, the line department, our department, it could be the utility company or the contractor, whoever is gonna be impacting that neighborhood. So we have a proactive plan to uh, notification. Uh, gets back to what Mr. Strunk says, you know, what level are we gonna engage that neighborhood? Are we informing them? Are we consulting them, involving them? To what extent? Uh, but there's gonna be a minimum. And what we wanna do is the Peoria way. Mayor, you talked about it earlier and the other. It's not just checking the minimum box. Yeah, we, we mailed something out. Well, does that mean we made a connection? Do we want, want to step it up, even if it's not our project? Hey, by the way, this utility company is gonna come out and do this. You're gonna, traffic's gonna be impacted. Here's all the information you need. If you're not being satisfied, contact us. This is where Adam and Daniel are gonna be those close conduits to the neighborhoods, especially those non-HOA neighborhoods who lack the capacity. And that may mean we wanna do flyering and, and knock and talks over and above it to make sure the message is received. And it gives them access to all the resources to have a better outcome. And in each of these, we're gonna work as a team to make sure there's proper communication to your level, city management, department, and community. Um, on, on the success, and we can set up our own uh, levels of success. What does that look like? And some, a lot of these will be subjective. You'll know, hey, I need to make sure this neighbor is in the loop, or this block is most impacted, just keep them up on it, or a, you know, it, we'll have those kind of subjective and objective metrics that we want to have in place for what success and failure looks like. And then the last one, uh, really, depends on how well we do the relationship building and the proactive, we hope to minimize a reactive, but the reactive we wanna kinda of have the emergency preparedness approach. We gotta be ready for things are gonna happen, as Mr. Trunk said earlier. We, we're gonna do our best to avoid them, but every now and then they are gonna come up and we wanna make sure it's given the appropriate attention when it does. And that's gonna mean putting this together a response level team uh, to deal with those. And it's gonna be either at the resident level or at the block level, or it could be at the neighborhood level. How are we gonna react and show that, hey, we're, 
we, we had a, a, a little mishap here, but we're on it. It's all boots on the ground. We have a multi-department approach. All resources are going to be dedicated to correct this and get back to the uh, and maintain the superior and high level of customer service that they come to expect. Uh, it'll include heavy information at all levels of the government with your offices as well as the city manager's office and the departments that are impacted. And, and one of the biggest things is going to be that last bullet on the right, reevaluate and adjust. This is a feedback loop that we see this, what lessons have we learned? Why did this come up? Did we miss an opportunity to be proactive? Did we miss an opportunity with the existing relationship? We should have known better that this was a pet peeve of theirs, lighting in their neighborhood or, or, or traffic mitigation when there's a project. So we use that to continue to update our CRM, again, at the resident level, neighborhood level, any number of information that can be maintained and documented through that for a better result the next time through. And before I hand it back over to, to Mr. Strunk, I just wanted to, you know, here's that three-prong approach. And, and, and the more, the better we do the relationship building and the proactive and a really highly responsive reactive um, through these communication efforts that directly correlates to the trust that we're going to build with them. Every reaction we do in a proper and expected form is going to help our relationship with them. Every proactive opportunity that a project or department is going to bring in that with a neighbor who we don't have a relationship gives us an opportunity to develop that relationship, put them in our database, maintain and nurture that relationship. Thank you, Chris. Um, Mayor and Council, to kind of conclude the presentation, um, this is something um, I've had conversation with with uh, the executive team, and we're committed to seeing these principles play out in this organization. We do place a high value on citizen engagements, and we understand there's a training component to this, and there's some organizational pieces we need to put into play, but we're committed to this. And we've done a good job. We want to do an even better job of this. So there's a couple key things we'll be focusing in on here. Um, what we shared with you is kind of over the next uh, couple, couple years, and if, if you really want to see the gory details, it's, it's in the report, and um, I'll spare you that. But we've got a good strategy laid out. We want to connect internally, so that, that team that we talked about, kind of a, a governor's team, if you will, um, out of the uh, city manager's office will be created. We are going to identify and confirm our liaisons within the city departments and the training component. We know we have to place the value on, on community engagement. And lastly, and, and Mr. Hallett mentioned it, um, you, this is, this is your world um, to a certain extent, and we understand that. We have value and we appreciate that. So you can look forward to heavy communication with your staff on this very topic. And it's the first step of a, of a journey that we're starting out here. But we uh, wanted to share this with you. And we'd like to kind of conclude it with uh, the typical, do you have any questions, comments, observations that you'd like to share with us? Well, I do have a comment. Um, a number of years ago when we first hired our sitting city manager, he told us that he wanted to um, manage a city, build a city uh, from the point of neighborhoods. And that is something that cities don't always do. You know, like with water, you tend to look 20 years out and you tend to think of the big picture and the infrastructure that's gonna be necessary for that in the long term. But talking about it from the point of view of people who live in these neighborhoods and the community pride and, and changing the culture within our city to think about it from that point of view is happening. And it's happening successfully. And so I'd like to thank you for putting this in place. And I would like to thank our city manager for deciding that that's the way we wanted our city to be managed from the smallest point of view, the point of view of every single resident that lives here. So I think um, we're off to a great start. And it's pretty crazy how you can take all of those technical aspects and make them into something very personal. And so I appreciate your expertise, and um, I'm looking forward to the way our city is going to be, the culture of, of our city and our employees and our residents as we grow. It's very exciting. It's great. I'm very pleased. So thank you. All right. Mr. Tyne, anything else? No, thank you for your comments and feedback, and more to come on that. Uh, that is all we have for our study sessions. All right, then we are adjourned until our 6 o'clock meeting.
Mayor and City Council welcome you to the Peoria City Council meeting. As a courtesy to others, please silence all phones. If you would like to address an issue that is on the agenda, or if you would like to speak to the Council regarding a non-agenda item, please complete a speaker request form, which can be found in the front lobby of the Peoria City Council Chambers or in the tray to the left of the speaker's podium. Please place the completed speaker request form in the second tray to the left of the speaker's podium labeled Request to Speak. All speakers will have three minutes to complete their comments. A countdown clock is easily visible on the left side of the wall behind the City Council dais. Only items listed on the agenda may be addressed by the Council. Since items presented as part of a speaker's request have not been listed on the agenda and due to the requirements of open meeting laws, the Council will be unable to respond to items presented as part of the speaker's request. However, please be aware that your comments will be noted. The speaker's name will be called to speak at the appropriate time in the order that the forms were received. Thank you for your interest and participation in the Peoria City Council meeting. Peoria City Council meeting will now come to order. Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection in the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Finn. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlett? Here. Vice Mayor Edwards? Here. Council Member Finn? Here. Council Member Binsbacher? Here. Council Member Patena? Here. Council Member Hunt? Here. Council Member Dunn? Here. Youth Liaison Tawari? And Youth Liaison Ben Winkle? Here. Welcome to the Peoria City Council meeting of February 16th, 2021. We continue measures to ensure the health and safety of our residents while assuring that the actions of your city council remain transparent. This plexiglass is one of the many changes that have been put in place amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Within the council chambers, masks are required and capacity is limited. The barriers you see between us allows us to conduct council business without a mask while controlling the possibility of transmission. For additional in-person in and remote viewing and speaking measures, please consult the City of Peoria website. We will begin this evening with the consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine or have been previously reviewed by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion unless a Council Member requests an item to be removed and considered in the normal sequence on the agenda. Tonight's consent agenda includes items that require a public hearing. Members of the public have been given the opportunity to submit comments and questions through a variety of electronic methods. If there is any member of the public present who wants to address a public hearing that is on the consent agenda, please complete a speaker request form and give it to the city clerk. We have not received any speaker request forms for the consent agenda. All right, seeing none, council, is there any items to be removed from consent? Seeing none, is there a motion on the consent agenda? So moved. Thank you, I have a Thank motion. You. Motion and a second. Council, please vote. Do you want me to do a roll call for Council Member Dunn? Yes, please. Council Member Dunn? Yes. All right. Thank you. And the consent agenda passes unanimously. <clears throat> And we will now move on to the regular agenda and new business. Item 8R is rezoning Camino Alago Marketplace, Lake Pleasant Parkway, and Deer Valley Road. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, Mayor. And Chris Hawkins, our Planning and Community Development Director, will present on this uh, rezoning item, which is for council consideration of an action. Thank you. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. 
Uh, item 8R this evening, this is a request to amend the uh, PAD zoning for the Camino Lago, place, Camino Lago Marketplace in North Peoria. Uh, Rose Law Group represents the applicant, who is the property owner, WM Grace Companies, and the developer, who is the MC Companies. The overall Camino Lago Marketplace is identified in red on the screen. It comprises 56 acres. It's anchored by a Walmart Supercenter. It's generally located at the southeast corner of Deer Valley and Lake Pleasant Parkway. The, um, the amendment tonight is of, of a 14-acre portion at the southern end of the uh, marketplace. The um, request this evening is to amend the Camino Lago Marketplace zoning from a PAD that is strictly commercial to more of a mixed-use planned area development that permits a mix of commercial and multifamily residential uses. So if it was approved tonight, uh, this would facilitate a 280-unit gated multifamily residential community. So the center, uh, is, again, is shown on your screen in more detail. It's at the confluence of three arterials, Lake Pleasant Parkway, Lake Pleasant Road, and Deer Valley Road. Those are all arterial roadways. There are two existing um, signals, one at Deer Valley and one at Lake Pleasant uh, Parkway and Lake Pleasant Road. The Camino Lago Marketplace, this was established in 2005. It was established at a time, as you might recall, when, when the big box format power centers were popping up around the valley in growing areas. Uh, the northern part of the center uh, is anchored again by the Walmart Supercenter and various commercial pads along Lake Pleasant Parkway. However, the rest of the center um, has struggled to gain traction except for a new EOS Fitness, which will, um, has been approved for a location north of the area in yellow. The overall center is within two miles of the area we call the Four Corners uh, at Happy Valley and Lake Pleasant Parkway, uh, where there is over two million square feet of competing big box and retail space. Additionally, the Loop 303 corridor emerged a few years after the establishment of this area um, to the west and north of the project, and this will someday provide additional um, development opportunities. More specifically, the area in yellow comprises 14 acres. Uh, this is the site in question. Some of the immediate context is the, again, the Camino Lago Marketplace and the EOS Fitness, the future facility to the north. Uh, to the east is the Camino Lago single family residential. I should say between the site in yellow and the neighborhood, there is a drainage channel, there is a roadway, and there's some uh, HOA common area open space. To the south are some vacant areas that are owned by the State Land Department that are slated for, I would say, intermediate uh, single-family development in the future. And then to the areas to the west um, that was recently purchased as part of, a, part of a state land auction by D.R. Horton. That would be developed by D.R. Horton for single-family. This graphic illustrates the general plan use, land use on the screen. Uh, the 2040 general plan was ratified by Peoria voters in November. The uh, Camino Lago marketplace is identified in the darker shade of red. Uh, it's designated as mixed use neighborhood village center. Uh, this was a change from its, from its previous single commercial designation. This designation promotes a more sustainable stop and stay development format. Uh, provides a lifestyle choice uh, that provides high amenitized convenience near services without the maintenance obligations that some are seeking. It provides for an integration of services, that is, employment, uh, public spaces, and residential, all in a walkable hub, in a walkable format. Um, this change in designation is from, also from a recognition that commercial retailing has drastic, drastically changed with the onset of internet retailing. Um, some might call it the Amazon effect, but essentially this is the convenience of buying things online. Um, at one time, you might recall, we saw commercial really at every signalized intersection in the city. Now we see more of a consolidation with a focus on uh, differentiation and also experiential retail built in. So as a result, some traditional power centers have struggled to build out. Um, you know, we've, this, this is one example, but we also have another example in our city, and that's at Northern and Loop 101, which uh, anchored by a, a um, target center, um, that is also a partially built out power center. And that center competes with new opportunities, uh, Park West, also Westgate, south of it. The general plan also then uh, attempted to reposition some of these longstanding uh, centers into mixed-use hubs, locations that can be further activated by a mix of uses. So the idea is that it reduces auto trips, it provides a lifestyle choice in proximity to jobs and services. This graphic illustrates the current zoning in the area. So whereas the general plan looks at the development picture in the future, 
Zoning provides for the regulations of specific defined areas today, so such as, you know, what is the building height in the area? What are the land uses that we allow today? What are the setbacks, parking, signage? Those are all things that are embodied within zoning. So when we look at rezones and we look at general plan amendments, uh, or, or I should say PAD amendments, we evaluate them in conformance to the general plan land use designation. So that's that mixed use designation that I just talked about in the previous slide. Um, the Camino Lago Marketplace PAD, as I mentioned, was approved in 2005 for the overall 56 acre commercial area. Um, it originally envisioned a build out of a power center. So it had standards that, uh, that were in line with that power center uh, vision. It allowed building heights up to 48 feet, for example, and a whole range of uses. So the proposal this evening is just to amend what was a uh, single use commercial PAD, planned area development, uh, to a PAD that permits multifamily in a defined area. So it's that area in yellow that I was uh, referring it to, to bring it closer to the general plan designation of mixed use neighborhood village. This slide provides for the conceptual development plan. Um, the community is proposed to be called the place at community, at uh, Camino Lago rather. And the name for this development was actually at the behest of a, some of the citizen input received in that there was a interest to really cement the larger Camino Lago as a, as a uh, community and recognize that this would be part of that community. So it's a horizontal mixed use concept and what I, what I mean by that is Again, it's an, it's an overall center that integrates commercial and, and residential uses, and so rather than having, for example, multifamily above retail, it's horizontal. So you have integration among all the uses. You try to look for common connections and uh, common uh, architectural uh, uh, influences there. The uh, project is a gated 280-unit multifamily community. It provides for a gross density of 19.8 units per acre. So it's within the 12 to 20 units per acre that the general plan designation uh, identifies. The units are a mix of one and two bedroom. Most of those are one and two bedroom. There are only 12 that are three bedroom units. Um, and the units are arranged as two and three story buildings around the site. So if you look at the screen, I've tried to identify, um, they're the smaller brown boxes are identified as two story. So if they have some two story carriage units along the perimeter where it shares a border with the single family area to the, to the east. Um, and then the other buildings are three story. So the three story buildings are 36 feet. The two story buildings are 26 feet. Also noted here are some enhanced edge conditions with the Camino Lago South neighbor to the, to the east or rather to the top of your screen. Um, none of the two-story buildings that you see will have balconies on there. And the perimeter buildings, I'll show you another slide in a little bit, but they all have uh, separation ranging from 160 feet to about 440 feet from the nearest residential lots there. The access within the site um, will all be internalized. So if you were to go out to the site today, there's an existing curb cut at the, uh, to the right or the southern end of this development, um, closest to the single family area. So the proposal is to close off that southern driveway and um, make all the access internal. So the access will come at two points within the center. And this again was a, in response to one of the citizen concerns that we receive through the process. Also, there are a variety of community amenities that are common with these types of projects. It will include a clubhouse and fitness area, a pool, kitchen with lounge area, dog park, open spaces, barbecues, and gas fireplaces. One other thing I mentioned too, you probably see the uh, red stars. So those are the pedestrian connections between the gated multifamily project and the rest of the center. So one of the concerns that uh, we did receive from neighbors was to um, increase or heighten the number of pedestrian connections to, so we have that walkability there. So um, they've maximized that to four connections. Okay, and so where I've mentioned that this is a, um, the, Predominant part of this amendment is a change to allow multifamily into the, what was once a commercial PAD. There was also, at the behest of some neighbors, a suggestion to modify some of the commercial, non-residential land uses in the schedule. So the owner has agreed to make some uh, modifications to the use listing, to limit tobacco retailers, gas station, and auto service to a maximum of one throughout the whole development. As with any rezone case, we have a public outreach process. Um, neighborhood meeting notice was sent out to all uh, property owners within a 1,320 foot area, which is a quarter mile, and all HOAs within a one mile radius. So that, com that computed out to 768 letters that were sent out. So the first meeting, of course, occurred in August, and that was during 
well, st we're still in COVID period, right? So that was all via the Zoom platform. Um, we had four members of the public that attended that meeting and the concerns and comments that were voiced at that meeting were of the following categories. There was a concern about, you know, how much traffic generation would this project uh, provide for? There was concerns about the access location because at that time the access was nearest the single family area. There were some questions about the height of the structures. Um, at the initial part of the planning process, the, some of the three-story buildings were on the eastern perimeter. So we'll, we'll talk about that was one of the changes that was, was made as, as part of the, uh, the input. There was also concern about use. Um, some didn't want apartments, didn't feel they were appropriate in this area. They questioned what the impact on property values would be. Some felt that um, additional commercial opportunities would be viable and, and they would rather the, the land area stay for commercial. There was um, some concerns about neighborhood safety, particularly um, would there be any, um, at, they asked if there'd be any connections from the multifamily development to the single family neighbor to the east. There currently aren't any connections. There's a six foot wall that separates the marketplace from the uh, single family development. The neighborhood also conducted an additional rather impromptu outreach meeting and they did a balloon test. And so what they did was they, uh, when they had a revised site plan that had all two story buildings along the perimeter with the exception of one three story building, they went out there and they um, hung balloons from where, the, where those uh, buildings would be and the balloon would, would be at the top of those buildings just to kind of showcase for the neighbors what they might be seeing from the vantage point of their home. And so there was about 35 to 40 neighbors that attended that meeting along with the applicant and the project team and they discussed a, a variety of things that you can see on the screen, all things that were uh, brought up uh, during the initial neighborhood meeting there. Overall, throughout the process, the city has received uh, 31 emails in opposition and um, they're in your packet and those are concerns that were identified at the neighborhood meeting. In a minute, I'll go through each of those concerns and how the project has evolved as a result of the input we've received. Um, the city has also received 11, actually it's 12 now, we passed out an additional letter this evening, but 12 emails in support um, from six businesses and six property owners, so you should have that. And they all came after the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. We've also received uh, communication from the Peoria Unified School District, and um, they've noted that uh, with only 12 three-bedroom units, this project is not expected to generate a lot of kids. Um, and also, through the COVID period, they've also been going through their own um, analysis of, of uh, enrollment impacts. You know, a lot of kids are going through iSchool right now. Is that um, phenomenon gonna continue even after we have, we're back to fully in-person schooling? They're, they don't know, but they're looking at those kind of things. But, um, I, I do want to mention that the developer has uh, met with the school district and they've discussed the project and they've agreed to the terms of a voluntary uh, developer assistance agreement um, with the completion of this project. Okay, so I want to talk about the um, evolution of the project. Specifically, let's go through all the concerns. Um, you know, the, the input that we receive from neighbors has, has been instrumental in shaping the project. That's how these projects were. So I also want to I also want to thank uh, uh, Vice Mayor Edwards. You certainly pushed the applicant to make these, con these changes and, and try to uh, mitigate the concerns of neighbors. So there's been a lot, of, a lot of things that have occurred. And I also want to thank the applicant. Um, they're here in, in place today, and they've also been willing to make some of these changes to meet uh, some of the neighbor concerns. So first off, we'll talk about uh, traffic generation. The, um, with any rezone case, we do ask that a traffic impact analysis be uh, be uh, done by a registered traffic engineer. It's reviewed by our traffic department. And so they look at the, how much traffic it's gonna generate, where the trip's gonna go, and what type of modifications might be necessary. So one of the things they noted um, in, in relation to the traffic generation concern is that multifamily generates actually less trips than commercial pads. So um, in the traffic report, they noted that there was uh, about 1,500 average daily trips that would be generated as a result of this project. If you look at one, Casual fast, you know, casual uh, fast food restaurant. They generate about twice that amount, or about 25, 2,600 average daily trips. So the multifamily does generate significantly less than a build out of a commercial center in this area. The other thing they made, and I mentioned this earlier, was the um, movement of the driveway. So they moved that driveway from the uh, the existing curb cut nearest the neighborhood, and they eliminated the access from Lake Pleasant. So all the access will be. Um, from the light, the signal at Lake Pleasant Road and Lake Pleasant Parkway, access into the development from internal spots within the marketplace. Pedestrian connectivity, um, there was a concern about, uh, you know, those in the, in the neighborhood going into the single family areas to the east. 
there are no current connections to the single family area and with this project they aren't proposing any future connections. Where there will be connections and where there was comment to, to increase the amount of connections, that's within the project so that the walkability is enhanced from the multifamily to the rest of the commercial complex. Other things was the building height and concerns about privacy. Um, as I noted earlier, the existing zoning does permit 40 feet in uh, height. With this multifamily community, we will comprise of two-story, which have a 26-foot height limitation, and three-story buildings at 36 feet. So I've noted the two-story buildings on the screen. The rest of those are three-story. So as I noted earlier, the site plan was modified to, to uh, react to this concern, and so you see uh, four of the five buildings along the eastern perimeter being at two-story with one at, at three-story. Um, no, none of the two-story buildings will have balconies, and also the third-story building that you see that's along the eastern perimeter, the top of your screen, rather, um, that's a, a building that only has four um, units on the third floor, so there will be four balconies that look out. And I should mention, too, they look out. Um, there's quite a bit of separation, and they're looking out to the side yard of the property uh, owners to the east. One of the things the applicant might bring up when they come to speak is that they did do a sightline analysis of the building locations, and they took a, they took a shot of... Uh, from a drone, where the from the height of the buildings, the balconies, with, with a six foot tall person, what are they seeing? And so, there with the separation, there isn't a lot of uh, visual impact from that three story building. And as I mentioned too, the uh, buildings range from 160 feet to 440, 440 feet. This graphic further illuminates that. This is in your packet. I realize it's hard for the audience to see. It's it's hard to see here, but. That just demonstrates the locations of those perimeter buildings and the separation from the nearest residential lot. So they do range from 168 feet to about 400 feet away from the nearest lot line. The three-story building, which is denoted with a 10 at the upper part of that, that is 190 feet to 440 feet from the nearest residential lot line. So that's what that's trying to, to signify there. Again, there were concerns I mentioned earlier about the, some interest in the build-out of the center for commercial. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this site was established in 2005. It's been heavily marketed in the last 16 years for commercial uses. Um, it has struggled to build out. And some of the things that we've noted, you know, competing commercial nodes, particularly with Arrowhead area not too far to the south, also the Four Corners area um, less than two miles to the north. Um, those are competing areas that also provide big box opportunities. The um, internet retail change in landscape has certainly changed commercial uh, as we know it today. And then also with the mixed use designation provides the opportunity really to rejuvenate or reactivate uh, a center that has struggled to build out. Um, with the concern with schools, I did note uh, the um, school district and the applicant have worked out a uh, voluntary assistance agreement that would help provide assistance and the project, as, as was noted by the PUSD, would generate very few students, given that it's predominantly a one and two story, or one and two bedroom uh, unit. Um, I think the applicant will probably talk about the, um, the market profile of its residents, and it's, uh, as they've mentioned to us, it's targeted generally to uh, empty nesters, young professionals, but um, uh, households that don't have, uh, generally don't have kids also. Other changes they made in response to comments was to, again, reinforce the Camino Lago to try to cement the overall community with that name and that brand. They've agreed to restrict some of the commercial uses, and they've also um, added a water feature and shaded area nearest the, um, the clubhouse area along Lake Pleasant Parkway, and this is to provide opportunities if, for car services uh, or other opportunities along the entry point. Uh, this item did go to the Planning and Zoning Commission, and with any um, public hearing, we do provide a notice of hearing. They also go out to all owners within a quarter mile radius and all registered HOAs within a mile. We also publish a legal ad in the paper, and we post the site according to requirements. So public hearing was held on uh, January 21st, uh, 2020. There were four speakers present at the meeting. Two did speak in opposition. Uh, their concerns were in line with what I had talked about uh, earlier from some of the neighborhood meetings. There were also two there in support. So um, after deliberation, there were a lot of questions by our commission. Um, they did vote five to zero to recommend approval to the city council. Um, and then as I noted earlier, uh, since the Planning and Zoning Commission, we've actually received 12 additional letters in support of the, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation. So as I summarize the case, um, at 19.8 units per acre, 
This does align with the general plan mixed use neighborhood village designation. In light of changes that we've seen in the, in the retailing landscape, this amendment positions, activates the power center for mixed use development, provides additional housing opportunities and lifestyle choices, and we believe it provides an, an overall improvement and promote walkability um, and critical mass in the area. So, Mayor and Council, with that, uh, the recommendation is to approve the ordinance subject to the conditions in Exhibit 2. And with that, I'm available to answer any questions, and I also know the applicant is here as well. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Hawkes? Mayor, I have a couple questions. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Chris, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, looking at your your history here in the book, it uh, looks like the developer and the residents have gone through some extensive um, talk back and forth. And it looks like, if I do my, my math, it looks like they've done 13 concessions uh, from when this project first started to where it is now. That's pretty significant um, in my book, and I'm sure it is in yours. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, you, know, you talked about the, the height of the buildings, you talked about the driveway, but some of the other things that you didn't talk about was um, shaded, uh, shaded walkways, additional seating, uh, water feature entrance. Uh, you know, those are a lot of concessions that maybe a lot of the residents that are watching today are not familiar with, and maybe they should know. And then my second question is gonna be, you know, we've seen an interest over the last couple of years of multifamily housing. Um, why do you think that is? And, you know, how much multifamily stock do we have in the city of Peoria currently? Thank you, Vice Mayor Edwards, members of the council. Very good questions. I'll start with the first one for uh, the first one about the some of the design concessions. So what we're looking at tonight is the entitlement request and the next phase of the process will to look at the site plan in, in more detail, um, which includes the site plan all the, the design details and the architecture. However, we have, we have spent quite a bit of time with the applicant on the site plan. They've also spent a lot of time with the neighbors on some of those concessions. So whereas the, the pedestrian connections were very important, also the shade, the shade within the project was very important. So not only are there a number of open space uh, um, uh, pods throughout the development that are shaded, but they're also um, um, shaded connections that reach, reach out to, to the commercial areas. Also, what was important too was a sense of arrival at the project from Lake Pleasant Parkway. So um, there were some um, um, design ramadas that were introduced near the entryway that not only provide the opportunity for those that might want to Uber or take an auto service, but they have the opportunity to uh, sit in a shaded area. But it also provides a little bit more of that design impact um, to kind of distinguish this development from other other developments that we might have seen in the past. So we're going to continue to work with the applicant on those design details and, and to ensure that this is a project that meets today's expectations for multifamily, if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. And then the second question, very good one. We have certainly seen a number of uh, recent um, multifamily cases um, through the, throughout the city. And this is a, perhaps a response to several variables. Certainly we're seeing the price of housing rise in areas. Um, we're also perhaps seeing some changes in um, lifestyle choice. People are looking for a, um, you know, a, a lock and leave lifestyle where they have the independence of, of leaving, but also have that nice and monetized development um, without the maintenance obligation. So I think we're seeing that. But what I'll tell you is we have looked at our numbers recently to understand, you know, what is that complexion of the city? What I'll report to you is that 75% um, of our housing stock today is single family residential, 25% of that is multifamily. When we've looked at that historically, that ratio has remained pretty static. So we, whereas we've seen some recent um, multifamily developments come online, we've also seen, you know, three times that amount in single family that have come online. So we've seen a very balanced community that, is a, that, is, that has come about, which provides, again, housing options for all of our residents here. Um, also, when we look at our housing stock relative to some of our peers in the valley, I'll note that um, Peoria at 75%, uh, we still have a much higher stock, uh, higher percentage of our housing stock as single family than some of our peer cities like Gilbert and, and Chandler and Glendale and Avondale and some of those cities that have more of a multifamily complexion. So I think we've grown very, um, very reasonably and we've kind of maintained that complexion of our city that has kept uh, Peoria a desirable place. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mr. Hawkes? All right, seeing none, I have a number of speaker request forms and due to our lovely COVID situation, uh, we do have some people who are waiting to speak um, located in another building. 
So I'm going to begin with uh, Diana Reagan and ask for her to uh, come up to the podium. Are you here? Ms. Reagan, please come up to the podium. Uh, you have three minutes to speak. Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Diana Reagan. I am at 9842 West Coil Avenue, very close to the proposed um, new units. Uh, I have lived in North Peoria for the past, oh uh, gosh, 18 years. So not too far from where this is at, but I happened to just move into uh, the neighborhood that's very close to it uh, at the end of September. So uh, this was kind of new to me moving into the area and I had not lived close enough before to know that it was a, um, something that was going on. So it was a little bit uh, disappointing. I am opposed to the proposed um, building just because every time I drive down the road, I see new, new buildings, new houses. There's new housing going up all over the place. Um, there's the very large apartment complex that was just is being built off of the 101 and Beardsley. It, this whole area has always been such a nice kind of, it's kind of like a quiet out of the way place. And just with all the building, um, it just seems like it's kind of losing the effect of being able to be kind of out out kind of in the outskirts of, of the area. So um, along with that, I do have concerns about the schooling. I do have a son in the Peoria School District and there is a lot of overcrowding. Uh, Liberty is at maximum capacity. I mean, even if you're not anticipating a lot of families to come in between the houses that are being built, the apartment complex is going in, that will stress further the um, school district. And I, I understand there's conversations with the school district, but you know, being a parent and knowing and seeing what's going on, um, I, it just really concerns me of uh, how, many, how much more influx of um, population that we can have in the area to help sustain you know, the current schools and um, the other services and um, just, it would be kind of nice if we had some more variety in um, just places to go versus just another housing unit going into the area. So um, I do thank you for allowing us to speak and, and give our vo voices, whether for or against the idea, but um, I certainly allow or, or appreciate you all giving me the opportunity to be here this evening and voice my opinion. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your comments. All right, the next speaker request form is, I've got Jennifer Hall here from the um, Rose Law Group. Would you like to speak now, Ms. Hall? Okay, thank you. All right, I have a speaker request form in favor from Mr. John Dorsich. I'm sorry if I cannot read that correctly. Uh, he does not wish to speak, but just wants to go on the record as being in favor. Uh, and then I have a speaker request form from Howard Grace, who does wish to speak. Is Mr. Grace in council chambers? Oh, I'm the applicant. I'll defer to Dr. Jordan makes your presentation. Okay. Uh, Andrus Nelson? In favor, wish to speak? Mr. Nelson, please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes to speak, sir. Uh, my name is Anders Nelson, address 9776 West Robin Lane, Peoria. Um, I am one of the, uh, the supporters of this project. Um, I had heard early on about the apartments coming in and I had a lot of concerns about the apartments. Um, I did work with one of my neighbors and we talked with the developer and um, a lot of those concerns are being addressed and I was converted. Um, my wife and I live really close. Uh, we live in the, uh, the community. We like walking down to the area. Um, we like walking to Peoria Artisan, one of the, one of the restaurants down there. And um, 
We like the walking paths. We like how the community has a lot of walking paths. And so one of my concerns was integrating and um, having it feel like it's a part of the community. I didn't want you know, just uh, an eyesore in the area. And those concerns were taken um, and addressed. And so I'm, I would consider myself a convert. And I'm in support of the project. All right, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. And I have another speaker request form in favor from Mr. Christian Williams. Mr. Williams, please state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes to speak, sir. Christian Williams, 10370 West Sands Drive. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council. Um, I've been a Peoria resident for 20 plus years, and I've lived in Camino Alago nine of those years. I'm in support of the project um, because it fulfills the general plan and we voted to create a mixed use neighborhood village um, with the Peoria 2040 general plan. If you would have asked me back when I moved to this neighborhood in 2011 if I wanted an apartment complex in our retail center, my answer would have been no. But the reality is the market's changed. There's a lot of competition in the area with Four Corners and Arrowhead. And again, I'm guilty of this. I, I shop on Amazon all the time. So I think that people, especially in my generation, we leave our houses to go eat and drink at places. So I think that the economy has really changed. My big concern is if this remains dirt, um, it's gonna end up being a big box warehouse or it's gonna end up being boat storage or dead storage. And I think that um, mixed use would actually bring some vitality to this area. I'm concerned about our current retailers being able to stay in there and be successful. So I think that adding some density to our area and creating walkability between the projects will actually make sure that our brewery can stay there and make sure our good restaurants can stay there. We also have four other dirt lots in the area. I want them to be able to market themselves and have some incentive to bring something new there. I want a brunch spot, I want a coffee place, I want a, a brew pub, so I want more things and I think that density is how you, you get there. I know a lot of my neighbors are pretty concerned about the idea of having apartments and what that could mean, but if you think about other prominent communities in the valley, you have Arrowhead Ranch, you have uh, Vistancia, Fletcher Heights has two apartment complexes, DC Ranch, Desert Ridge, those all have high density components to them and they're thriving with retail um, and restaurants of that nature. I think when I did some research on this, five out of the seven articles I said said, the biggest draw driver of your home value being decreased is when you have a giant building directly behind your house and blocking light or views. In this case, you have an apartment complex, you have a landscape tract, you have a wash, then you have a public street, public sidewalk, and then a neighborhood greenbelt. So in my eyes, this project does a great job of making sure that you don't have just a big bulky building behind a community. Um, again, I'm, I'm in support of this because I emailed the developer probably 24 times. <laughs> I asked for four pedestrian connections, with which they have done. I said, if we want this to say luxury, it needs to have some curb appeal, a shade structure for, you know, those Uber rides, some public art or a water feature, they've done that. I appreciate Mr. Grace for saying no more gas stations and service stations in that center, because no one's gonna pay $1,500 to walk to an oil chain shop. You're gonna live there so you can walk to a nice Italian eatery, or go to the gym, or go to the brew pub. So I appreciate those concessions as well. And because those are all in the site plan, I'm, I'm in favor of this project. So I won't keep rattling on, but I think that this vote yes on this will fulfill the general plan, get some retail or some density in this area so that residents can walk to their center and not be on the road. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, I do not have any further requests to speak from members of the public. Uh, would the developer care to speak at this time? Welcome. Mayor and Vice Mayor Edwards, members of the council, for your records, I'm Jordan Rose with Rose Law Group. Here on behalf of the applicant, Howard Grace, um, and why don't you wave, and Leslie Bryce from MC Companies. Uh, my planner, Jennifer Hall from Rose Law Group, and I wanted to thank Chris and Cody. Uh, your staff has been amazing to work with. We've been working on this for almost two years now um, through the general plan amendment, which makes this consistent with that. Um, and I just appreciate all the time that you guys have given, as well as our neighbors and the vice mayor. Um, I think, as um, Christian said, we've uh, had a really close relationship with them and, in fact, have communicated um, so much that we were just talking, Jennifer and I, that we're going to miss our discussions, um, but we know that going forward we'll have um, some good ones, too. I have a full presentation that I can give you if you'd like. Um, it'll take a few minutes, or I can just run through the things that 
that we've done uh, for the neighbors in response to that, whatever, whatever you'd prefer, Mayor and, and, and Vice Mayor. Yes, since we already have had a presentation, okay. I would appreciate hearing the things that the concessions that you've made. For okay, yes, um, Mayor and Vice Mayor, um, these are just some of the, the concessions. Um, relocated the primary entrance to the interior of the marketplace and away from the adjacent neighborhood. Um, we eliminated the southernmost driveway closest to the adjacent neighbors in and out of the marketplace. Uh, four of the five perimeter buildings will be restricted to 26 feet, which is just two stories. And note that under the, the current zoning, the buildings can be up to 48 feet. So our tallest building will be 28, uh, 12 feet below um, what uh, it could be today if it's not rezoned. Um, none of the two-story uh, buildings on the perimeter will have balconies. We added architectural details to all sides of the buildings. We added amenities to the multifamily and we recruited EOS foot Fitness to locate on the site, which will be quite an amenity. The third-story perimeter building near the EOS will have uh, just four balconies on each floor and the first and second floor are not visible at all from the neighbors, and then we are um, planting trees to ensure that uh, those on the third floor will also have no uh, view. And in addition to that, we relocated the building to slant it so that the only view is of the street and um, some trees on the side yard of a, of a um, neighbor who's actually uh, commented in support. Uh, the MC Companies has uh, agreed to donate $140,000 to the Peoria Unified School District, even though our demographics are, are um, as one of the neighbors said, uh, not very conducive to families. Um, but in any case, uh, we're doing that because they really believe in um, supporting your school system. We agreed to use the word Camino a Lago um, in the name of the community, so it's called the place at Camino a Lago. And we agreed to four pedestrian gates to encourage walkability between the uses. We added sh shade structures, shade walkways, seated areas for res residents to utilize car services, Uber and the like. We added a decorative water feature to the entrance and then the owner agreed to restrict the number of tobacco shops, gas stations and an auto service shop in the entire marketplace. Uh, we tried to be incredibly responsive to the neighbors and we really appreciated them um, spending so much time with us. It was a lot of work on their part too, so thank you. This is a really a textbook example of, I think, how this should this process should work. Thank you. Thank you. Council, are there any questions for um, Ms. Rose? I just have one. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jordan, um, can you tell us a little bit about who your targeted renter is uh, and what uh, is the projected rents for this development? Uh, yes, uh, Mayor and Vice Mayor. Uh, the target renter, the, the, uh, there will only be 12 units that have three bedrooms. So most of them are one and two bedrooms. So they're retirees or they're um, younger people who have just um, maybe graduated college and have a job working in Peoria and want to be able to live here, work and play you know, near, near their um, offices. So we're really excited about that. And the target rental is, I'm gonna just look at the MC companies. One to $2,000 per month. So these are considered luxury apartments. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Councilor, are there any further questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, are there any other members of the public present who wish to speak to this item? 8R. All right, seeing none. Council, is there a motion on item 8R? Mayor, I'll make a motion. We have a motion and a second. Council, please vote. Council Member Dunn, can you tell me if you're for or against? For. Oh. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will now move on to item 9R, rezoning Thunderbird Estates West, 75th Avenue and Thunderbird Road. Staff report, Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you. And Mr. Hawkes will again provide a presentation. Mr. Hawkes, our Planning and Community Development Director. Mayor and Council, um, item 9R, this is a request to amend the Thunderbird West PAD zoning. Um, the applicant in this case is John uh, Jurdis from Texas Land Engineers. Uh, the site is identified on red on your screen. It's about 1,000 feet west of the 75th Avenue and Thunderbird Road intersection. 
Uh, the site is approximately 1.63 acres, and the site, along with the, um, I think it's a UMB bank to the east, they both comprise what's called parcel three in the PAD, so we'll talk about that in a minute. The proposal this evening is to amend the PAZ zoning for parcel three to permit a drive-through restaurant use. So if approved, the decision would facilitate the development of a new drive-through restaurant. Um, the intended user is Taco Bell. Right now, you might note that the, there's a joint Taco Bell KFC facility near 75th and Thunderbird. Uh, Taco Bell Corporate apparently has requested that the, that the existing restaurant, uh, the Taco Bell portion rather, be relocated as a single-use restaurant rather than a combination format. So that's why they're seeking uh, another location. This graphic illustrates the context in the area. Again, 75th and Thunderbird, as you note, is a, is a signalized arterial intersection. All four corners of this intersection have commercial uses. Um, what's known as the Thunderbird Estates uh, PED was approved by council back in 1997. Uh, this was a 37 acre PED or planned area development that established three parcels. So you can see it um, on the screen. The 37 acres is identified with the, with the perimeter, yellow perimeter. But the parcel one was a single family component. That's where the existing Thunderbird Estates West uh, single family is today. And then the rest of it was uh, two commercial parcels. So there's parcel two, which are most of the commercial uses along Thunderbird and 75th. And then there's parcel three, and that's the subject of this evening. Parcel three is a vacant site and a, uh, the, the UMB bank. One distinction between uh, parcel two and three, parcel two allows for C2 intermediate commercial uses. That's the most common commercial zoning district we have in the city. And parcel three is subject to 01 or office commercial uses. And the record, the public record at the time is a little unclear, but perhaps the reason for that is that perhaps parcel three at that time was seen as a transition parcel. And so um, there was, you know, less of a use allowances than the rest of the PAD provided for. One distinction to note that'll come into play this evening is that parcel two, the um, uh, commercial along Thunderbird, allows for restaurants, sit-down restaurants, and drive-through restaurants. Parcel three does allow restaurants, but it doesn't allow drive-through restaurants. So that's the, probably the most important distinction there. In terms of the site context, uh, the north across Thunderbird is single family and the Bashes Center. Uh, to the east, the UMB Bank and other uh, commercial uses along Thunderbird. To the south is existing single family residential and to the west is an existing uh, uh, church site. This graphic provides a little more uh, context for the commercial parcels in greater detail. So what we tried to illustrate here, you can see in yellow, one of the yellow boxes, that's where the existing KFC Taco Bell combination store is. But it does illustrate that there are already a number of existing drive-through businesses along this strip. There are uh, two drive-through restaurants in, in parcel two, and there are, th there are then three drive-up banks that have a, have a drive-up component. Um, the UMB bank, which is on parcel three, is a drive-up facility. Um, again, this PAD doesn't permit drive-through restaurants, though. As with the last case, rezones and PAD amendments, uh, they're evaluated against the 2040 general plan. The general plan does designate this strip of commercial uniformly as commercial. Um, this designation is typically applied to areas along arterials, and they can really are comprised of neighborhood serving uses, um, some of which may be auto oriented in character. This graphic illustrates the uh, proposed site plan. So while the, the PAD amendment uh, proposed the insertion of drive through restaurants as a permitted use for parcel three, uh, the applicant was agreeable to a number of limitations uh, to heighten the compatibility with surrounding residents. So um, some of those things I'll go through. The access into this development would be from an existing shared access with UMB Bank to the east. The amendment, um, rather the language in the PAD, would increase the setback, which is right now 30 feet. It would increase it to 75 feet. And actually, if you look at the screen, they're, even though the minimum is 75 feet, uh, they're showing on this site plan 87 feet from the back wall of residential to the drive aisle, and the building's even farther than that. Um, also limits that there would be no signage along the south side of the building to, again, heighten compatibility with the neighbors. Um, the speaker box would also be oriented away from the residential. And there would also be a, a wall that would be um, uh, perpendicular with that, so that would try to attenuate sound. 
Um, they've also agreed to some adjustments to the speaker box that be automatically adjusting so that there be volume controls that can adjust sound to align with our city code. They've also agreed to uh, shield any lighting away from residential homes. And the hood system, uh, in a minute I'll talk about some of the concerns, but odor uh, might have been one of those, but the hood system will also contain additional odor scrubbing mechanisms to, to try to mitigate that odor. Uh, public outreach process is required, and so uh, this one also occurred during our, our lovely COVID period. So this was a virtual meeting via the Zoom platform on May 18th. Uh, there were two citizen attendees that uh, uh, participated remotely. Uh, the comments that they had, uh, they, were, they had questions and concerns about noise mitigation, um, any nuisance activity that the, that the restaurant might generate, the species of trees along the southern boundary that would abut the, uh, uh, the residential use and the site, site configuration. How could the site configuration be changed to mitigate privacy, or to, to uh, I should say, increase privacy and mitigate noise? And that was an introduction meeting. There was also the required neighborhood meeting that occurred the, the month later, uh, also via Zoom, and there was one citizen attendee that participated. Um, the resident did appreciate some of the concessions and considerations that were made in the site configuration, but um, their, their overall view was that they preferred not to have a, a drive through restaurant behind their home. Now through the process, uh, we do require when it comes in that there be, uh, we, we send out two notifications, one for notice of application that invites residents to inf get some information about the project, how they can participate, whom they can call to provide their comments. And we send that to all property owners within a 600 foot radius and all registered HOAs within a one mile radius. We do that again prior to the case going to planning commission and council, we provide that notice of hearing postcard. And as you noted from the last one, we publish an ad and we post the site uh, throughout the uh, extent of the project, we've received three emails in opposition to the project. Uh, they cited uh, concerns with light, uh, trespass, noise generation, and odor. Also concerns about a drive through restaurant and its proximity to residential. And there were concerns that, uh, that the use would increase traffic along Thunderbird and that it might, all, um, it might introduce other types of hazards. Um, and, that, and the city has also received one email in support from a, from a business in proximity. Now this case did go to the Planning and Zoning Commission on October 15th, 2020. At that meeting, there were two speakers uh, from the public and both uh, were property owners from the neighbor to the south. They did speak in opposition to that. Um, they had concerns with the, the noise that they believe would be generated from the speaker box specifically, and also the 24 hour nature of the project. This was gonna be a 24 hour uh, drive through restaurant. Um, they also had concerns about uh, public safety. At the time, I should say, the site plan showed a wall further to the south, and there were concerns that that might provide um, hiding vantage points for, for those behind the wall, adjacent to the wall of the single family. Um, and so the commission had a, a number of questions, and uh, the, I, I would say the prevailing opinion at that meeting was that when the PAD was established, um, it established a, this parcel, parcel three, as a lower intense commercial parcel and did specifically um, not permit drive through restaurants. And so the, the prevailing opinion was that um, people bought into that knowing that, that, you know, some of the things that drive through restaurants would, would generate versus regular restaurants would not be present on that site. So the commission was sympathetic to that view and did vote uh, six to one to recommend denial of the PAD amendment. So after that time, you'll note that was back in October, the applicant spent quite a bit of time regrouping, um, discussing the project, also trying to um, see what types of changes they could make to maybe bring the restaurant to, a, to behave more like a sit-down restaurant. And so um, they prepared a, a number of things. Uh, they moved the wall, because you'll remember the wall was a concern by some of the neighbors, but they moved the wall to the north, so it's directly adjacent to the, uh, the speaker box, so that would help better attenuate sound from the speaker box being, uh, instead of it being located further to the south where some of that sound might bounce up and over into the neighborhood. They also prepared a uh, noise study um, to evaluate uh, that and, and one of their findings was that the, and it was prepared by an acoustical engineer that they, that they uh, contracted with. The study indicated that the, with changes, the AM, PM noise uh, will significantly be below Peoria's noise ordinance. So it will not violate a noise ordinance in the AM or PM peak times, uh, and, and it's measured from a threshold at the property line with single family. 
And they also looked at the uh, consideration of the hours of, of operation. So um, they did propose modified hours of operation. Um, they are indicating that instead of a 24 operation, they are agreeable to hours from Sunday through Thursday being from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., Friday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. So it would no longer be a 24 operation. Um, the hope is that this would move it closer to a traditional restaurant that has hours that are, that are more in line with those hours that they're proposing there. So Merrick Council, um, so the recommendation from the Planning Commission was a uh, recommendation denial. Staff did recommend uh, uh, approval of the case. Um, this is one of those cases where we did receive new information and new changes to the project since the Planning and Zoning Commission hearing. So there are a couple ways we can go with this one. We could certainly uh, vote uh, in support of the commission recommendation of denial or um, looking at the new information, um, perhaps this information is compelling and maybe something that should be reconsidered by the Planning and Zoning Commission. When you think about the distinctions between a standard sit-down restaurant and a drive through restaurant, uh, arguably I think there's probably two uh, distinctions. I think the hours of operation are probably, is probably one distinction and perhaps a noise, a noise from the speaker box. So they have made uh, changes to the site plan to try to control that noise. They did study the noise um, impact. They've also made hours, uh, uh, imp uh, changes to the hours of operation. Is that information compelling? If, if you believe it's compelling and you wish to remand it back to the commission to have them reconsider it in light of those changes, we would ask that you uh, remand it back to the March 4th Planning and Zoning Commission hearing. Um, the other choice, of course, is if the council um, um, believes the changes that were made are compelling and you vote to approve the case, then the recommendation by staff would be that you introduce a new commission that would then note the modified hours of operation um, uh, as we've indicated on the screen. And so with that, I'll take any questions and, and the applicant is here as well. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Finn. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Chris, a, a couple of um, questions. I want to confirm the current zoning there, because what I, I believe I'm hearing, I just want to clarify for people that might be watching at home or in the audience, that really the only difference here is the drive-through component. Is that correct? Between a restaurant and the Taco Bell going in, it's really the drive-through piece of it. Mayor, Councilmember Finn, that's correct. So both areas allow, dry, or allow regular restaurants, but Parcel 3 doesn't allow a drive-through restaurant. That's the main distinction. Okay. And are there, would there be hour restrictions on a regular, normal sit-down restaurant? Councilmember Finn, no, there aren't any restrictions currently. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I made a few notes here. I want to make sure that I kind of get through them. I, I, I've been somewhat involved in, in this one. I actually, um, for the rest of the council, I actually went and knocked on doors in the neighborhood and um, tried to engage some conversations, which is kind of difficult during COVID-19. <laughs> People are a little reluctant to open the door to a stranger. Um, but I did have some conversations with, um, with some of the neighbors and looking at, I'm not fundamentally op opposed to the to the project, it seems like it somewhat fits in there, but we have had an incredibly long-standing respect for P and Z. I've been here for six years and I think we've only gone against P and Z one time. Um, and I think when we did that, Bill, you mentioned it had been probably another, I'm not even gonna mention how old you are, Bill, but ten. It had been a while, though. 40. I mean, we can really only think of two times that, 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 we've, that we've, um, we've done that. I do know that we have a, a number of people um, that would like to speak. I, I will just say I would like to remand this back to P and Z. I'm not comfortable with um, with doing something outside of the P and Z. I think we just have too much respect for what they do. But I do think there have been enough changes made by the developer that it would be worthy of going back to P and Z. So, I'm not putting that as a motion yet because I know that people um, potentially do want to speak, um, but. That's my position, being in, in my district and my, some of the conversations I've had with both the developer and the neighbors. So. Okay, so we have a motion to remand this item back to P and Z. Do we have a second on that motion? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, I will still um, entertain the speaker request forms that we have here and ask if you want to continue to speak, knowing that this is going back to P and Z to be heard again uh, since there have been changes. Yes, Mr. Aukas? Mayor, with, with, the, with the motion as stated, uh, I just wanted to clarify that it would be to the March 4th Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. I love the technicalities. Um, I would motion that it be remanded back to the March 4th, 2021 Planning and Zoning Commission for reconsideration. Thank you. Got to keep me on my toes, Chris. Stays. Yeah. All right. Thank you. 
All right, and so now I will ask each of you if you, if you still care to speak or if you want to um, wait and speak at the March 4th PNC meeting instead. And that is, we will start with Mr. Brian James. Are you in the council chamber, sir? Yes, sir. Right. Mr. James, if you would please state your name and address for the record, you have three minutes to speak. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. My name is Brian James. I live at 7658 West Drew de la Moore. I'm one of the residences directly behind the lot that they plan on building on. Um, it's a two-story lot. The three houses there are all two-story lots. So part of the concerns that we had was the amount of traffic that would be coming through there, even at later times of the evening. I work for the fire department, so sometimes my schedule is kind of hit and miss, and I try to get sleep when I can. So my concern would be with uh, the last hearing you guys had, traffic could increase up to 2,600 vehicles there a day. So that's a lot of traffic flow that could be coming through there, even till 11 or midnight when I'm up for shift at six o'clock the next morning. So that's a concern for mine. Um, also another concern I had, like we had discussed before, is by them putting that barrier wall there, there's a lot of potential of riffraff and what have you to hide and stay between that barrier wall and our residence. Um, if you drive down Thunderbird near the freeway, you've noticed that there's a lot more panhandlers, there's not a lot more homeless people that are out there, and those people are just looking for a place to hide at night. Um, there's a high school up the street. I'm not saying those kids aren't good kids or bad kids, but they too are also looking for places to maybe get into trouble. And if you put an eight foot or 10 foot pole, tall barrier wall there and gives them access to do whatever it is that they want to do, I'm concerned that that could back up to my residence. So that is a concern that we have. Um, there have been break-ins in the neighborhood, and I just feel that that could increase the risk and possibilities that we have for that, along with the noise and the extra traffic flow. Being on the second floor, we're still going to see all the lights of the vehicles coming in, shining up to the second floor hearing the noise of all the vehicles rumbling through there at night. So those are our concerns. Thank you very much for my time. Thank you for your comments, sir. All right. Um, Mr. James Kramer, would you care to speak or would you care to wait until the March 4th PNC meeting? Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. And you have three minutes to speak, sir. Okay. My name is James Kramer. I live at 7710 West Boca Raton, which is actually directly across the street from where this is proposed. Uh, thank you for your time. I'll try and be brief. My wife and I have lived in Peoria for over 40 years. Uh, this is our second house in Peoria, and we've been there 22 years. Um, so we have seen the traffic on Thunderbird increase over the years. One of the issues we have is the amount of traffic that's currently on there because of the fact that there is no access to the Northwest Valley other than Bell Road, Grand Avenue, or Olive. Cactus and Greenway don't go through, so that puts all that traffic right on Thunderbird. Obviously, there have been a lot of accidents that have been caused in that area. The Bashes, that's right there, has a choke point. It has three lanes that narrow into two, and it's right at the back end of the Bashes, which has also caused multiple accidents one of which took out the power box and left us without power for several hours. Um, our neighbors are here, Rob and Don. We've had an accident where a vehicle went through their back wall, uh, ended up in their yard. Uh, the neighbors that live directly to the other side of us were trying to pull out and uh, his wife got T-boned right there. The issue we have right now is there's so much traffic already on Thunderbird that if we want to get out onto Thunderbird, we actually have to go up Calivar to 75th Avenue, go out and then get on Thunderbird that way. And I'm sure all the folks that live on Calivar don't appreciate all the extra traffic that's going on, on their street. The traffic on a daily basis backs up past our street, which is 77th Avenue. So people get tired of waiting in line so they cut through the neighborhood and cut down our street because our street is the only one in the neighborhood that doesn't have the speed bumps. So it kind of becomes the freeway. 
Same thing in the morning for the kids trying to get to the high school. Once the street backs up, they cut down our street just to get up to 79th Avenue there. Um, there is obviously, I have no issue with Taco Bell whatsoever. Um, my issue is the traffic that it's going to bring to the neighborhood. Um, through the earlier presentation, as I said, a drive through restaurant brings in excess of 2,600 extra trips on the road a day. And that road is already, even at 11 o'clock at night, it is sometimes difficult to pull out onto Thunderbird. And it doesn't matter which way you're going, left or right. It's very difficult to get out. Uh, Sorry, I'm looking at my little notes here. There, if they want to continue with this, there is a better location. 79th Avenue and Thunderbird already is a controlled intersection with a light and there's an empty lot there. If, if that's what they want to do with the restaurant. Like I said, I don't have a problem at Taco Bell. There's already one there. My problem is if we're gonna separate them and add an extra restaurant, then we're just adding all this extra traffic to the area. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, sir. All right, Mr. Philip Cooley, would you care to speak or would you care to wait until the PNZ meeting? Please state your name and address for the record, sir, and you have three minutes to speak. Yes, thank you. Uh, Philip Cooley, 7652 West Rue de Lamore. I am one of the houses directly behind the project. I uh, have a lot of comments prepared. Most of them were based on the fact that it's a 24 hour drive through. With the concession, I still feel a lot of my comments are still valid because of the time going till 11 to midnight. Um, one of my first concerns is prior to moving to Peoria, I lived in Surprise. When I bought that house, I had to sign a, a waiver saying, I realize jet planes are gonna be flying overhead from Luke Air Force Base. When we bought this house, we went upstairs to the second floor. We heard traffic from Thunderbird. We knew that was something we had to deal with when we bought this house. Those were choices that we made to, we accepted those choices. Having to deal with a 24 hour or 16 to 17 hour drive through in my backyard was not a choice that I was afforded the opportunity to make and not an opportunity I was able to make at that time. So my concerns with that, as mentioned previously, eight foot wall, what kind of attention is that going to attract? What kind of activities will occur in between my block wall and the eight foot sound wall? Uh, the applicant has graciously listened and tried to make several concessions in response to concerns, but they only have control over certain factors. They do not have control over what the um, uh, patrons of the Taco Bill will do. They don't have control over how loud they will have their stereos as they're waiting in line. They don't have control over how loud their mufflers are when they pull through the drive-through. Again, 11, 12 o'clock at night, kind of, kind of not a fun time to be having these loud noises in my backyard. Um, the previous speaker mentioned the lot at 79th Avenue and Thunderbird. It is currently zoned for a drive through restaurant. I'm not trying to say not in my backyard and push it to my neighbor's backyard. The difference is our houses are two-story houses. The houses behind the lot at 79th and Thunderbird are single-story houses. If you've never lived in a two-story house, noise is a lot worse upstairs than it is downstairs. I think that has some, of, some to do with the intent of why the zoning is the way it is. So I, I just wanted to bring those points to your concern and thank you for your time to speak tonight. Thank you for your comments, sir. Okay, um, Robin Ware. I have a Robin Ware and a Don Ware. Actually, it's Don Ware, right? We're twin brothers, so you've seen one, you've seen the other one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, just one of you is going to Mayor, speak. Council members. Right. Uh, my name is Don Ware. I live at 7709 West Boca Raton Road. And I'm opposed, obviously, to the uh, implementation of the zoning. W one question, if, if it gets changed, the zoning gets changed to full commercial or whatever that is for drive-in, they can alter their hours after that, can't they? 
Um, in other words, there's no rule then at that point saying, oh, we, we can't be a 24-hour restaurant. They can be a 24-hour restaurant. Is I'm sorry, correct? sir. We're not able to answer your questions during public oh, comment. Sorry. But Mr. Hawkins, <laughs> if you want to go ahead and chime in on that. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, I, I'm the gentleman also who uh, had a car crash through his uh, backyard on some Saturday morning. There's a choke point there. People do 50, 60 miles an hour on that choke point to get by so they can cut off the rest of the traffic. They rear-ended somebody who was just sitting there minding their own business, probably doing 30 or 40, and pushed them into the wall. Nobody was injured. So I'm just saying, you know, not alone, you know, uh, the, the, besides having a commercial drive-through <laughs> uh, opposite my house has a lot to do with my property value, but I think um, there are alternative locations. Uh, one of the things I suggested to the, to the uh, PNZ I'm <clears throat> sorry, yeah, the commission, uh, was that there's a, um, a blight areas in Phoenix, in Peoria, I mean, <laughs> Phoenix too. But why can't they make some deal or negotiations or agreement or some allotment to, to uh, give a, a plot of land in a blighted area on I mean, Grand Avenue or something rather than uh, RS? I'm going to save some more for uh, P&Z. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, sir. Okay. Um, Christy James? You'll, did you say you'll pass? I'll pass? All right, thank you. Dan Biswas. Uh, good evening, um, council, uh, Councilman, Councilwoman, Mayor Carlot, uh, Director um, Hawkes. I appreciate you guys have taken the time to uh, let us come in and speak regarding our project. Um, it seems like we covered quite a bit in the in the director's. Um, uh, the director's presentation. We had uh, had a, uh, a presentation also as well. Um, a lot of it's, it has already been covered pretty in thorough detail with um, uh, Director Hawkes' uh, presentation. Um, but there were a couple of things that I wanted to to bring up. Um, you know, uh, some some of the neighbors have brought up the increased traffic. Um, you know, this is this is something that's going to be addressed through the the site plan process. Uh, we have provided a, a, a preliminary uh, traffic impact statement um, that addresses some of that, those, those questions. Um, as this is also a, uh, uh, an existing store, um, the majority of the, the, the traffic will be the same as what it is already, and, and the increase in traffic will be much less than what is uh, typically expected with a new store. Um, separately, um, I think there's been a misunderstanding of the location of the wall. Uh, originally, in the, the process of the, the, the citizen outreach and, um, you know, the concessions that we went back and forth with the neighbors uh, during those, those two meetings that we had via Zoom, um, it was proposed to put the wall 87 feet from the south, southern property boundary line. Um, since then, um, you know, we, we kind of went through this process a little bit dis discombobulated prior to the, the Planning and Zoning Commission hearing. Uh, with that said, uh, you know, we, we took some time. We were supposed to have our city council meeting uh, back in November of this year, or of this past year. Uh, we took some extra time to go through and, and do the, the noise study because basically, you know, we needed to take a, take a step back and look at what the actual uh, issues that, that came up. So, so going through the, the Planning and Zoning Commission hearing, uh, notes and, and listening to, to the concerns that came out of that meeting. Um, the primary concern that I think that the, the comm commissioners did address that were, they were completely correct on was that um, even though we made a lot of concessions and we tried to do whatever we could to make the neighbors happy and, and to make sure that it was a win-win situation for everyone, um, you know, we, we kind of missed the mark on, on the, the true intent of the zoning case and the stipulation and what the stipulation was put in place for. Um, so with that said, um, you know, the, the, the actual stipulation on Partial 3 says the development on Partial 3 shall conform to the development standards of the Intermediate Commercial C2 Zoning District, except the buildings will be limited to one story in height. The building setback along the west boundary of the subject parcel shall be 15 feet. A 15-foot landscape buffer shall be permitted along the southern boundary of the parcel. And then the last uh, statement in that um, stipulation is what uh, has brought us here today. And it says, uh, uses shall be limited to those allowed within the 01 office district. And so, you know, as, as uh, Director Hawkes has, has mentioned, there's, you, know, you can speculate exactly what, what came out of that, that hearing back in 1997. 
and, and what the, the true intention behind that was. But um, with that said, uh, it's been mentioned in the presentation that the, you know, a restaurant use is, is zoned by right in the, in the, the Office One uh, commercial district. So uh, you can put a restaurant in there. Uh, the, the hours, as, as uh, Director Hawkins mentioned, uh, wouldn't be re uh, restricted uh, for a normal restaurant. So they could theoretically be open. They could have, um, you know, the, the, the hood vents letting the smell of the, um, you know, the food coming out uh, without any kind of uh, need to address the, the public or go through a public hearing process. Uh, in addition, there's other um, concessions that we made, like uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the variable uh, um, volume, excuse me, control of the, uh, of the, the speaker box itself. So, so um, that was another one that, that's not something that would have been required. Obviously, it, with a drive-through, that's something that, that uh, you know, we were willing to, to, to include. Um, Additionally, uh, the, the bank parcel next door has a drive-through, so that, that parcel is also uh, encumbered by the same zoning stipulation uh, as, as what encumbers our parcel. So if you look at the true intent of the, the zoning stipulation, it's not to restrict a restaurant. It's not to restrict a drive-through. It, it is truly to make sure that the, the residents behind the property can enjoy the quiet uh, enjoyment of their property in the late afternoon, late, late evening hours, uh, you know, um, without a 24-hour drive-through. And so ultimately, um, you know, we went through, we, we added a lot of concessions because we, we, we want to be good neighbors. We, we want to uh, make sure that the neighbors are happy. Um, so, so the first thing we did was we went through and we had a, a, the acoustical study done because, you know, going in um, to the planning and zoning hearing, we had we're like, we thought, okay, we can put a wall there, that'll help attenuate sound, but there's no scientific evidence of, or, or back, back up to, to show exactly how that will do that job, right? So, um, so we, we hired an engineer, um, and we decided that we were gonna go through the process of, of, of figuring out exactly what the, the noise impact would be from a drive-through. So he, he started out by um, you know, monitoring the existing site uh, to find out what the, the current levels of, of, of volume uh, at the same distances were uh, just a little bit over from our site. Uh, additionally, he, he measured volume on the, uh, the site itself for ambient noise at, at uh, both during the daytime and at night and at three in the morning um, and took the, the, the measurements of what those noise, noises would be. Uh, with that said, obviously, we went through some of the... the um, the noise study findings uh, in the in the original presentation by Director Hawkes, uh, those those showed that at the wall, uh, the uh, the property boundary wall, the the decibel level would be far below uh, what the the city's noise ordinance would be. However, um, going back to my original point that I kind of circled away from was the location of the wall. We decided. Um, very thoughtfully because of the, the, the direction of the, the noise uh, engineer that we would move it to the north. So it is now no longer on the south side of that driveway. It is on the north side of the driveway directly next to the, um, to the drive through. Uh, so with that said, it's much closer to the speaker box. Um, I did per, uh, provide a, an exhibit uh, that kind of shows the, the line of sight cross section. So there's three uh, separate views that you can see. Uh, I don't know if there's any way to pull that up or. It, yeah, it is on. It is in the presentation. So you could probably go to page uh, further back. It's probably it's towards the end. Uh, a little bit further, I think two more. Uh, right here, okay, so, so this is the actual site plan. The site plan in, in uh, Director Hawkes' um, uh, presentation was the original site plan, and, and you could see that the, where he had the 87-foot measurement. You, you, can, you can barely see it, it's a little bit far, farther away, but there's a black line that goes uh, east to west, and then at an angle, a 45-degree angle northeast, and then north, to the, uh, you know, towards the speaker box. You can also barely see there's three blue lines. Uh, one is, is at a 45 degree angle that goes directly to the, um, the residential on the neighboring property behind the bank. 
and that there's a distance of, I think, 190 feet from the, the boundary wall and then another 22 feet between the boundary wall and the speaker box. Um, separately, there's the two other lines, B and C. The first one, line B, is it goes from the speaker box directly to the, the closest property boundary to the south. And then furthermore, line C is, is, a, is basically a same cross section, but it, it starts at the, uh, where the car would be parked in, inside the, or not parked, but stopped inside the drive through lane. And that was to consider the noise that a car would, would make um, by revving their engine, by you know, having their stereo playing, and, and what effect that wall would have on blocking that, that noise from, from coming to the south and, and going to the, the neighbor's property boundary line. Um, so if you can go to the next one. Uh, with all that said, these are the cross sections that we, we, we had. They're scale drawings. Uh, as you can see on the first one, that's line A. Uh, you can see the line of sight line is barely, barely visible, but you can see where, where A is up in the top right. Um, that is basically the line of sight from where the speaker box is going over the wall, and it shows in reference to the house, a two-story house, how far above uh, the house, the sound would be uh, from that speaker box. And that is uh, 190 feet plus the 20, 22 feet between the, the speaker box and the, and the wall itself. Um, the second one, uh, line B, as I mentioned before, that was from the speaker box directly to, to the south property boundary line, the closest, the closest house. Uh, and you can see that there's a 41 foot uh, difference uh, between the, the speaker box and the wall, uh, and then another 115 feet uh, between the, the wall and the actual uh, property boundary line. Um, and then again, on the, on the bottom, it's, it's a similar situation, uh, the, the, but the car is directly next to the wall there uh, within 13 feet from the, from, the, from the right side or the left side of the car uh, to the wall. And then um, I think it's 114 feet to the, to the property boundary line uh, of that southernmost house as well. And you can see from there, any sound uh, from that car would be well above, 47 feet above uh, a two-story house. Additionally, this, this uh, exhibit shows a few other things. So uh, we had a, a scale put on the bottom of the, of the, the drawing that, that shows basically every 25 feet, uh, and, and it has a, a corresponding calculation uh, that, that goes <coughs> with uh, uh, each 25-foot uh, increase in, in distance, right? So, so right at the wall, I, I can't see the numbers here, but you, they're color coded, and that uh, that scale on the bottom is basically a, you know, a real world scenario. So what what the de de decibel equivalence would be in in like layman's terms is, as in like uh, rustling leaves or a whisper, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So as you can see, the the colors of the of the decibel levels get further and further darker to the to the blue blue side as you go to the right. Um, and at the property boundary line, the, the loudest uh, decibel level that would be reached at a five foot level above, above ground would be less than 30 decibels, which is the equivalent of a whisper. Uh, and, and that is specifically with that wall in place and also with the, with the uh, property boundary wall um, closest to the neighbor as well and the effects that they would have. Um, Additionally, we made some concessions to add some fins to the, to the box itself uh, that direct the, the speaker directly into the, the car and into the direction that it needs to go rather than letting the sound go wherever it needs to go or wherever it would go, uh, which would also decrease the, the decibel levels that are shown on that exhibit uh, significantly. Uh, additionally, the volume control um, system that we mentioned before uh, would also further reduce the, the decibel levels of the uh, speaker box, um, basically taking into consideration the true intent of the, the zoning stipulation. Um, so, so those are the, the main considerations that we, we put together uh, to, to kind of you know, help out with the, with the noise concern. Um, and, and so we uh, also did some other things. I mean, there, we, we added a, quite a bit of uh, extra landscaping um, you know, some of the concerns that were brought up were the, the lights that would so be So if I might interrupt you for just a second, sure. were these items that you put into um, your plan after your Planning and Zoning Commission meeting? Some of them, yes. Some of them, no. Okay. Uh, so so the, there was a few, um, like the, 
the, the hood vent scrubbers, those were uh, initially pr presented from the, from the comments that were made at the very first meeting with the, with the neighbors. Um, that was one uh, item that, that was brought up. And I think, you know, we were kind of reactive when we were, when we were making those concessions. And that's why that wall was put in, because people were like, well, you know, how can we block the sound from coming in? So there, we said, okay, we'll put a wall there. And then other people were like, well, okay, then that creates additional concerns with safety and people hiding and, and that kind of stuff. And so it wasn't really thought through. It was more of a reactive situation. So that's when we brought in the noise consultant to truly take a, a look at, okay. at how the, the greater picture affected everything uh, from a, from a okay. more holistic. And so it sounds to me as if there were items that were put in place after you got, after you were voted denial. Correct. And, and it also sounds to me like there is some critical information that needs to be disseminated back to the community as well as the planning and zoning commissioners. Correct. So on the floor right now, we have a motion to send this back to planning and zoning, which would give you that opportunity to speak Correct. again and with I, the community. And I did want to ask one, one thing, it, if we could amend the, the motion to do a conditional approval. Uh, that way maybe we wouldn't have to come back to city council if the if the council could vote to uh, approve it pending approval of the planning commission. I don't know if that's a, a possibility. I appreciate but. that, sir, but that is not the motion that we have on the floor right now. So um, if you would if you wouldn't mind, we will just go ahead with our with our vote right now. Okay. And thank uh, you for your comments. Yeah, I appreciate there that. There will be more opportunities for you to um, speak again and speak to the community again. Yeah, yeah I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I see Michael Finn, uh, Council Member Finn. Did you want to make another comment, or is that your request from previously? I believe that was my request from previous. Okay. Uh, so the motion on the floor is to um, remand this back to Planning and Zoning Commission. We have a second. Uh, Council, would you please vote on that motion? Council Member Dunn, do you have a for or against? Uh, for sending it back to P&Z. And that is for the March 4th meeting. And that passes unanimously. So there will be more chances then for the community to hear your, your um, sound study and um, all of the other concessions that you've made. So thank you very much. Thank you all for, for attending today. All right, we will now uh, move on to the next item on the agenda, which is called the public for non-agenda items. And I have received no speaker request forms for non-agenda items. So we will move on to reports from the city manager. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. No comments tonight, but thank you. Thank you. So then I will move on to reports from the Youth Council liaisons. Mr. Van Winkle. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor and Council, I have a quick update about something Youth Advisory Board is engaging in. So. On March 15th, the workshop hosted by our Peoria Youth Advisory Board alumni group is planned where college readiness will be discussed and taught and it'll be a roundtable webinar type workshop. Um, so it'll be a very informative and productive event that us as a Youth Advisory Board are excited for. But for more information, um, please refer to the City of Peoria website. That's all for me. So the Youth Council Liaison Alumni Board. I love that. That is so great. <laughs> oh, I still have a slight correction. Um, it's just no, um, so any member. I'm sorry? Did I get that wrong? Um, slightly. I just want to provide a little bit more clarification. Sure. Just in case yes. anybody else perhaps did. Um, so any previous member of the Youth Advisory Board, um, not just liaisons, are ah. um, able to become alumni. And so we do have a group um, relatively new of alum, uh, Youth Advisory Board alumni from previous years. So I just wanted to provide a little bit of clarification, but um, they'll, they'll be hosting the event. So okay. thank you. Good. That's great. I love it. Um, thank you for that clarification. And it's broader than I thought. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Tuwari. All right. So just as a PSA, the Youth Advisory Board is currently recruiting new members. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, the Youth Advisory Board is an amazing opportunity for youth to get involved in their city government and community and to meet incredible new people and so much more. So for more information on how to apply, please visit the City of Peoria website and you can just search up the Youth Advisory Board to get more information about it. And one more report from February 25th to the 27th at Centennial Plaza, the Youth Advisory Board will be supporting Bloom 365 in its Silent Witness Initiative. 
Um, the Silent Witness Initiative is an event with life-sized cardboard cutouts of victims of teen dating violence, of teen dating violence. and attached to these cardboard cutouts will be um, short biographies of their life and their legacy. So um, we are really excited for this event and to spread awareness about this really important issue that the Youth Advisory Board is really passionate about. Um, so that's all I have for today. Thank you. Are you inviting the public to that event? Um, yes, it is open to the public. Wow, that sounds very dramatic and informative. Good, thank you for that. All right, there being no further business, we are adjourned.